Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Rob's Gaming Table. Uh, my name is Rob. If you're new here, uh, this is uh, what I call Rob's Cafe, where we just casually hang out uh, and chat about tabletop gaming, this YouTube channel, crowdfunding campaigns, general board game industry news, just fun stuff. Just hang out. Picture this, uh, the whole reason for these, these streams was a way to kind of lock me down, you know, like a work meeting to just sit around a table and, you know, or, or meet at the local coffee shop, have an offsite meeting, you know, and we just kind of casually catch up. Um, and I take the time to actually look at crowdfunding campaigns. Cause like, I don't know, lately that's not been a real fun thing. It feels like a big waste of time. Um, yeah, backing crowdfunding campaigns now for 10 years in this hobby. Uh, there's a lot of letdown, a lot of disappointment, a lot of trash. And uh, it's really just depressing uh, to, to open up GameFound or Kickstarter or BackerKit or GoFundMe or I just want to end the stream already. This is a snooze fest. But um. Anyways, this was a reason to kind of on a semi regularly schedule, if there was anything interesting, I would schedule a meeting and we would come and casually hang out, have a cup of joe, relax, talk with the chat, we'd hang out, we'd all talk amongst each other. I pass on my information to you, you guys pass on information back to Way Street. Uh, we just kind of casually talk. This is not me trying to tell you what games are good, what you should back. I'm just going to look at things that interest me and some of them are for the first time I'm even looking at them. Uh, because I, I don't care, like I, I don't like doing it. Some things get me excited, but it's very rare. So I only schedule these streams when there is something I feel like talking about or something I'm interested in. Um, doesn't mean it's interesting for you. Doesn't mean that it's something you're into. Uh, I hope this is just a place for, you know, um, people who support the channel, whether it's through donations, just spending your time here, chatting, watching archive videos, whatever, just to come and hang out. We chat about some of these things, uh, different news and different projects and things. Um, so if you don't see one of these for another six months, it's because I just didn't care to talk about anything I saw on crowdfunding or I it, it, it didn't need, a, um, it didn't interest me enough to warrant a full stream. I may have just talked about it with our members in our Discord um, privately. We could just chat about it in there or I maybe just talk with Mel or maybe I mention at the end of a playthrough stream, we quickly talk about something or in a Q&A stream or something. Um, but just understand if you don't see these uh, every so often, it was always designed to be that way. I hate meetings. Meetings are the number one way to interrupt and, and prevent progress and work from being completed they're usually a complete waste of time uh this can totally fall into that realm so just know that um so yeah full disclosure there you go full honesty open opinion um so yeah doesn't mean there's anything great on crowdfunding right now but there's some interesting things i want to i want to look at and talk about because people have been asking uh so let's look into it but if you've come here to be like oh man should i back this game uh, I don't have that answer for you. I, I, if you want to see how the game is, go find our playthrough of it. Go watch us play it. Talk about it as we play. See our reactions. See how the game works. Go down the rules. Download the rules PDF. Go look up a how to play video. Go see if the game's right for you. Go check your bank account. Go check with your significant other. Go check with your gaming group. Um, look at the mechanics list. Kind of see if it has mechanics you like in games. Um, but I'm I'm not that person. I don't know you. I, I don't know what you like. I don't know your bank statement. I don't know how many credit cards you max out. I don't know if you owe the mob money. I can't tell you if you should buy a game or not. Nobody should. Nobody should. I mean, they could tell you they like the game, but that that's not, you don't come in here going, hey, should I buy this, Rob? Is this game good? Should I buy it? You know, I can let you know my thoughts, but it just make sure that's just a piece of what you're using to kind of decide on a game. I'm not here to influence you one way or another. I know it's an ongoing joke. I'm just here to present cool stuff I like, you know, so that I'm also having fun doing this job. So I'm playing games that I'm interested in. Sometimes I play games I think I'm going to be interested in, and then I don't like them. Uh, so yeah, that's a thing too. Just because it's on the channel doesn't mean it's something you should buy. That's for sure. And uh, yeah. Yeah, even some of my favorite games, I fully, uh, there are fully things in there that I do not like. In every game I've ever played, there's no perfect game for me. And also some of the games I really love that people played, they're not, they don't like them. They're not for them. They're not for everybody. No game is for everybody. So stop being a sheep. Stop listening to the masses. Stop backing things just because everyone else is. Find stuff that you like. Go to your local game store. Try some stuff out. Play with their game library. Go play with a friend. That's how you'll find your games. This is not the place. Not the place. 
There's your rant. All right. There's rant number one today out of the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there you go. How many people did we lose? All right. If I didn't lose anybody there, I didn't get my message across. All right. That's all I can say. But yeah, so sorry, Erwin. I can't tell you if you should back Osorn. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, or anyone else asking about it in the chat. I see you guys are crazy. We'll we'll get to the Osorn uh, Kickstarter campaign. We'll talk about it. I want to see what's new in it. Um, I kind of looked up a little bit of what's new in it, but we'll go. I want to read in the FAQ and find out like what's really going on with it. See if we can get some info out of it. Um, but we have a few other things to talk about along the way. Um, I have no time cap on this one today. I'm thinking my max in my mind is roughly three hours. So predict that if that's the case, it'll be a four hour stream. That's the way it usually works. So today I don't have another stream this evening to schedule for to go set up, to rearrange things for, to read rules for nothing. Our next stream is tomorrow night, uh, continuing Jurassic World, the legacy of Isla Nublar. Uh, we're hopefully going to get that campaign done this week, which should open us up to get back to some other campaigns or start some new games or whatever. It'll just free up some of our time slots, which is nice. I'm looking forward to seeing how that one finishes out. Um, it's the closest one to the goal line is what I think is going on there, but uh, yeah. Uh, so let's see, what are you guys saying? Anyone have any questions? Anyone, anyone new here doesn't know what these streams are about? Um, needs, needs to, needs to know. I put in the video description, like kind of like a description of what we kind of talk about, but I just want to let you guys know. <laughs> Only three hours. I know I, I, it might not go three hours. I'm just letting you know. Usually I have a list of topics to talk about. But then what I love about this is you guys will bring up some and then we'll start talking about those. And when we're looking at a game by a publisher that I've never heard of, I'm like, wait, let's look into those other games they've made and their other projects and see if they failed or canceled or whatever. Then we get off side tangents where someone says, oh, Rob, you like this stealth game or whatever? Hey, there's these three other stealth games that are really good that came out five years ago. And I go, oh, I've never heard of them. And then we look those up. So this is very a um, that's the part where it's different from a work meeting. Um, it's more like an executive lunch, you know, where you kind of go off site and it's casual and you're kind of like hanging out and you're not really care about the time. It's a Friday. That's kind of like what this is. This is not like a one hour scheduled meeting where we're trying to meet a, a deadline. This is like a, I don't want to feel pressure. We're going to talk about everything we need to talk about. We're going to go over it. And if there's some things that are at the end or near the end, when you guys are like, you guys, you, Rob, you missed this. You should check this out on crowdfunding or this comes next week. Let's go look at it. We'll do that. Like, it's not just me. We're all in this. You guys are all spending the time here today. Um, so we can all, all get involved. This is not just me dictating uh, and telling you, this is what you need to know. Like, we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about some things. You guys are going to enlighten me. Maybe I'll enlighten some of you. That's rare, but I, I might. We'll see. Um, but yeah, that's just what it is. We're, we're in a cafe. We're hanging out. It's chill time. Uh, if you want to go up to the counter, anyone wants to grab a muffin or a, uh, you know, a biscuit or some cake or something, um, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge. Um, and, but yeah, grab a coffee or whatever your beverage of choice is, a tea, some water, whatever. Um, get all that and sit down. We're going to be here for a while. We'll probably take a break because, you know, the, the coffee and... You know, all that stuff kind of runs through you a little bit. So we might take a little break for a couple minutes here and there, and we'll get back to it. So uh, buckle up. Buckle up. Here we go. All right. Uh, so the first thing, let's start it off with some fun. Uh, uh, this one, I, I remember I put this on the list like a month ago, but this wasn't enough. I'm not going to make a whole stream about this or anything, but this is just something funny. And I want to get some opinions. I'm going to do a little poll in the chat on this one. Um, Let's see here. So uh, I saw this pop up. Uh, this was in end of September. Yeah, so basically like a month ago. I saw this pop up on a feed somewhere. This was in the board game group on Facebook. I don't know where. Maybe it showed up on Facebook when I was on there. I don't know. Either way. So this happened in the comments of a Star Realms. I think like the most recent Star Realms Kickstarter from like a year or two ago. And they're having trouble getting stuff out. Well, finally, they started shipping and delivering. But there was a goof up. I don't know how widespread it was, but they accidentally shipped people like double orders. So people were receiving two copies of their game. Um, and basically, the company realized the screw up. So they're obviously because some people are getting double. Other people are fully missing out on their orders, I think. So the company, what they did, they started reaching out to everyone that got their screwed up. And they offered to pay to have it shipped back. Um, to get their copies back so that they can then ship them out to who needs to get them. 
So somebody, I, I don't know, they're blacked out their name here. I'm sure you can go over to the comments of this campaign. I don't know which one it is. Um, but basically the person went in the uh, Kickstarter comments of the project, you know, where everyone can see it, who backed the game, everybody else who backed it, and the create, creators and everything. This is from uh, Wise Wizard Games, Rob Doherty's company, which you can see there on the screen. So this person came in the thing. And I mean, this could be divisive. This is similar to the pineapple on pizza kind of debate or the, you know, pancakes and waffles, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm curious where you guys would lie in this. I'm, I'm going to read about it now. And then in a couple minutes, I'll put up a poll. And I want to know where you guys would stand on this situation. Then I'll let you know after you guys say how, and I'll explain how I would handle the situation, how I have in the past handled this exact situation many times. Um, so here it says, I just got the game I ordered and a second one that I didn't order smiley face. So bonus, uh, in either case, the quality is great. And I do love the magnetic catch on the box. The size of the rule book doesn't bother me as for everything else. Rob, AKA Robert Doherty, um, has been upfront about what we are getting and what he said we are going to get. And in my case, two of them, it's been a long, long road to get here. So obviously tons of delays. Hey, welcome to Kickstarter. Nothing ever comes on time. And if it does. Uh, you basically just pre-ordered a game that was finished. That's what happened there. Um, but I'm happy with the destination, okay? Um, I don't know if these are in the right order, uh, but it was funny. I went and actually found this on uh, crowdfunding a month ago. I'm not going to go dig through the comments to try to find all this again. So I just I just saved this post, but, um, but let's see. Uh, yeah, this is... I, I can't see it all. But basically, uh, let me see. I need to get rid of this box, I think. Oh, I can do it like this. Yeah, something's YouTube, or um, because I'm not signed in, it's got this stupid box down here. But if I uh, zoom like, oh, I had it, I tricked it. All right, uh, this says, Robert's, uh, the creator, of, like the CEO of Wise Wizard Games replies, uh, one of the co-creators of like Star Realms and stuff, replies and says, I'm so glad you got your game. If you wouldn't mind, please send an email to support at Wise Wizard Games to take care of the extra game you received at no expense to you. Okay, I have a little rant there, but I'll hold it for a sec. Okay, and then the guy replies, or the girl, the person, whoever replies, <laughs> the evil villain laugh, you know, for sure that's not a, it's not a, um, you know, a ha -ha -ha funny joke. It's like a <laughs> evil laugh. <laughs> Boom, slams down fist. No. Uh, and then someone replies, yikes, like again, you know, uh, so somebody replies, some businesses used to just mail stuff out and then send bills for the stuff that wasn't returned at absurd prices. I remember the CDs in the mail, you know, get the CD off the shopping channel, you know, and then they're like, or they just show up in your mail. And if you don't stop it, it just keeps coming. Um, we'll send you one cassette tape each month of the greatest hits. Uh, that doesn't mean that returning a bad shipment isn't the right thing to do, but he's under no obligation to do so. So someone's defending him. Uh, and then the, the person who came on here to gloat that they got two copies and say, I'm not sending you back anything said under both federal and state law, it absolutely became my property at the moment it landed on my doorstep. So this person's obviously in the United States, uh, cause they're dropping like actual legal codes and locator. Do we have locator here to help us out with this? Um, and you're right. I'm declined to go through any effort to, I'm disinclined, sorry, disinclined to go through any effort to return it, including the personal expense of packing it back up and taking my time to go to the post office to help the line, the pockets of Wise Wizard Games even more. Not after this Kickstarter and not to a company like Wise Wizard Games. Wise Wizard Games isn't some charity. They are a corporation and one that hasn't exactly behaved well. I'm giving it to my niece. <laughs> And that's it. There was more and there was people fighting over it. It went on and on. You could probably go find this. I don't, I don't have links to it. Uh, it's whatever the most recent Star Realms uh, thing was, some kind of big box thing or something. Um, but I'm curious, based on just the information you know, just any Kickstarter, any Kickstarter. Okay, let's take Wise Wizard Games out of it. Uh, would you return it? Okay, so two copies of something showed up. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how big the company is, how little it is, just tabletop gaming. They're all generally, there are small husband and wife companies shipping out of the garage and there are bigger companies, but in, in the general terms of business, uh, there is really no large board gaming companies. Maybe Asmodee is kind of there and like Hasbro or something, but everyone else is kind of like, you know, not really that huge, but, uh, you know, um, but there are some things to consider. If you got two copies of your Kickstarter that you paid, you paid $500 for some all in. 
and a whole other $500 all in showed up. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you ordered a little $40 card game and you got two $40 card games, you know, or $20 card games, you know, with $40 shipping, whatever it is, it showed up and you got two of something. So in this case, it's a Star Realms. I think it's like some big box full of Star Realms cards. It's probably an average price game, you know, nothing on the low end, nothing on the high end. But would you ship it back if the company offered to work with you through email, you know, maybe give you some FedEx code or you, you know, they'll PayPal you the money, whatever it is, but you have to work with them to figure it out. Hopefully they pay you up front. But again, shipping something is not super simple. Uh, if it's still in the box, yeah. I mean, this company could do the, the print label for you, but either way, you have to physically take it somewhere to ship it unless they're actually paying for the service for them to pick it up from your home. But then you have to be home to give it to the person, uh, you still have to like print labels, uh, you know, or go get them printed. So you'll have to leave your home, drive the package somewhere. There is effort here. And it, they say it's no expense to you. So I don't know if Robert Doherty, I don't know more details, but I would assume he would probably offer to pay your time and effort to go to back to the store or the, the UPS shop, the FedEx store, whatever it is, pay for the labels, pay for your gas, all that effort. Because if it's no cost to you, truly like your time how do they pay for your time of fixing this mistake it's not an instant fix it doesn't magically your doorbell doesn't ring and the guy comes in your house slaps a label on it walks away that doesn't happen right um but yeah i know i know wise wizard games and a lot of publishers have like had delays you know have not sent people their products had to you know not been quick through customer service so this person's justifying it saying, you know, like you made the mistake. You also took way too long to give me my game. You've messed up before. You guys haven't been truthful in, in delivery times or quality of product or whatever. But what would you do? Would you, you know, you feel bad for the company? Would you, would you go put it in or would you be like, Hey, your mistake, screw you, do your job better and keep it as kind of like a bonus, give it away as a gift, sell it online, whatever you want to do. It's kind of yours, right? I, I'm on the camp of it's yours. Okay, I've had companies that have like sent me products that say they're going to last a year, two years, five years, and the product breaks. A and it breaks sometimes after warranty uh, of, of 30 days or whatever, or even under warranty. And I reach out to them and they say, yeah, no problem. We'll replace it and we'll fix it. And sometimes they charge you shipping to get your replacement because that's not covered. Um, and then they reach out after and they say, can you send us the previous thing back? I 100% every single time tell them blow it out your ass you're not getting this back i'm not spending the effort to send you something busted i'm not and sometimes yes i've even gone and bought the parts later to fix it and give to a friend if it's like a, an electronic or some kind uh i've done that because you sent me a broken thing you sent me something that didn't work as long as it should it failed you better fix it so i still have something that i fully paid for i didn't get my value out of and you're it's at your cost and especially if they make me pay for any kind of shipping I'm not spending any money or time or effort driving that broken product or whatever it is back to them. I know they may want it as like proof. They may want it to research and develop to try to improve the next iteration of the product. But why is that on me? Why am I testing your uh, your faulty product out? Why why am I a tester? Why are you charging me for a, a working product? And, and I have to spend this time without that product. I'm even spending the time emailing you for a replacement. Like you've already inconvenienced me you're not inconveniencing me more. That's my attitude towards it, okay? That's my attitude towards that kind of stuff. I know this isn't the same. This is like uh, just two things showed up. So let's say I ordered uh, this gaming headset. Okay, this gaming headset, it showed up and I got two of them and I paid for only one. I'm keeping it, 100%, I'm keeping it. I don't care who it is. I don't care who it's from. I don't care. I don't care if it's, it's one dude that designed 100 headsets and he made them by hand in his home and he accidentally sent me two, I kind of don't care. You screwed up. That's the way I am. You know, how many times we get screwed over in life by different things? Sometimes you just get lucky. I don't know. It's not a big deal. Usually people can recover. If they made a mass mistake where they literally doubled up hundreds and hundreds of orders, yeah, that sucks for them. But that was a big mistake. And they can either fix it by printing more and sending them out to the customers that didn't get it. But mistakes are made and some are really costly and I don't think it should inconvenience the consumer. It's your mistake. 
That's where I am. I would say no. I wouldn't send it back. Not even to Wise Wizards Games. I met Rob Doherty. I met his wife. This company's cool, mostly. I've seen some stuff they've done. It's like not really the coolest. But uh, again, they're a small company. So yeah, I don't know. Even if they offered to pay for the shipping and stuff. But if they paid for my time, you know, maybe threw in like a... We'll, we'll give you a discount on the next Kickstarter or something. Maybe. Yeah, sure. Okay. If you're making it worth my while for the inconvenience, but... If it's just straight up, you are just going to pay for the shipping to send this thing back to you. I know what it takes to ship a board game back to a publisher. I've done it from press copies I've received that they wanted them back. Um, sometimes after they told me they wouldn't, um, and I just tell them no. But um, yeah, don't inconvenience me. No, 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 no. I gave you my money. I didn't even have to do that. So don't inconvenience me. That's how I look at it. You made the mistake. Do your job properly. Uh, learn from it, you know, learn from it. That's how I am. I'm a little more strict with that stuff. I've had too many companies just screw people over. They're really in it just for the bottom line. I don't care who you are, small company, big company, you're in it to make a profit, right? So put some care and, and effort into it, you know, measure twice, cut once. That's how I am. But that's me, a little cold hearted with that stuff. It's business. It's the cost of doing business, <laughs> you know? But I know behind every business, there's people and there's families and, you know, you got to support things and all that. I understand that. But yeah, in general, in general, companies, yeah, man, get, come on. They have whole departments based on like just trying to like learn their cup, com, uh, c customers buying habits and manipulate them mentally with marketing and like just to take advantage of them. And, and you know, uh and they also have a department they pay for that fixes replacements and warranties and stuff like that. It's part of doing business. It's part of doing business. Don't get into the game if you don't expect some uh, overhead costs for that stuff. Otherwise, like, you're perfect and good luck. Um, but anyways. All right, I'm going to close the poll. Thanks, everyone, that voted. Yeah, time is valuable. I agree, Billy. 67% uh, say yes. You guys are too kind. Too kind. Now, again, I didn't go super specific, probably in this case with Wise Wizard Games. I'm sure they're, you know, they're trying to cover shipping. They'll do what it takes. You know, they'll maybe send you a coupon, maybe a free expansion pack or something, maybe a discount coupon on the next Kickstarter. I don't know where this went, but I just read it and thought it was kind of funny on both sides of the coin. It was funny. This person's like looking up legal stuff and posting it. Other people are defending him. Some people are fighting and saying they're a loser and they should have just shut up and not posted anything online. And just kept quiet. But there are a bunch of people. There was another post from Robert saying that other people did send it back. And it was rare to have anyone causing any problems. But, uh, you know, I was just curious what you guys thought. I just thought it was an interesting thing. I don't know if this has happened with other crowdfunding campaigns. But I just saw it and I was like, well, this would be a fun one to talk about. It's just interesting. Because, like, yeah, I could easily be swayed both ways, though. So I say in general, I don't send stuff back just based on companies I've dealt with. Um even small publishers, I, I, yeah, I, I've not done it. But I have done it for ones that are nice about it and that kind of thing. And I realized like, yeah, okay, not a big deal. I don't mind. You know, I'm going there anyway, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, it's just interesting. Just interesting. Uh, I just thought I'd start off with a little drama there. And uh, <laughs> that was a fun one. Uh, but yeah. Uh, let's see what you guys are saying. Uh Tanya says, I guess Rob doesn't use Amazon returns. Oh, I use Amazon returns. Absolutely. Absolutely, I do. But you have to understand Amazon in Canada is not as good as somewhere, some other place in the world. So a lot of stuff isn't on Amazon Canada. It's very small. And the quality is kind of lacking. The options are lacking. So I still buy stuff from local stores. I still buy stuff from name brand companies. I still go to I actually physically enter stores to buy stuff. Or I order online from other retailers across Canada. Um, I order from everywhere. Everyone gets a little love. Even my friendly local game stores. There's like six or seven stores in, in Southern Ontario that I order from. Some I go physically. Some I order online, pick it up. Some I order to my door, even though I could drive and get it. Um, I support everyone a little bit. I like to spread the love, but, um, yeah, I do returns. I do. Uh, I buy electronics all the time for filming, uh, you know, cameras, lights, sound equipment. I buy, you know, video game stuff, computer stuff. Um, and yeah, sometimes things fail. Sometimes things don't work. Sometimes things don't perform as they would. Um, but yeah, I, I, I will deal with it. I will, you know, reach out to the company. I, I will fully use that warranty form. I will follow things up. I will say, you know, it's been a year and this 
you know, video game console or whatever, it's having issues or this controller broke or this camera just isn't working the way it should. Something doesn't work on it. This thing failed. This, I don't know, this thing doesn't hold a charge anymore. And it's only been three months. Like what is going on? You know? And I know in the U S like Amazon's like a big thing, everything's on there, but not necessarily in other countries. So just understand, I wish it was like that. Um, but yeah, I do order stuff off Amazon.com also like the US one, uh, but I have to pay extra sh extra to send stuff back um, if I go through there. So it's a little a little risky too. So yeah. But I understand it's the same issue, right? Like if, uh, if, if Wise Wizard Games was on Amazon using it as their storefront and they sent you two copies of, you know, uh, whatever it is, an $80 all in Star Realms thing and you got two copies there and you choose not to send them back, you're still screwing over Wise Wizard Games in the end, right? Like Amazon gets their little cut and all that, but you know, it's the same deal. Even though you might think, oh, screw Amazon, I can send stuff back, whatever, you are still punishing that producer of that product, you know? Like, but then again, why is that product not doing what it said or not meeting your needs or failing or not living up to expectations? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. But yeah, I don't return stuff often to Amazon, maybe once every six months. I feel like I buy a lot of electronic stuff that's like sometimes and like, I, you know, like I buy some lights, you know, I, they're on all day, all the time, right? Like some studio lights, like I use them all the time. So like I will put them through their paces and, you know, sometimes they fail quicker than maybe they should. But uh, I for sure will. Yeah, you know, even if it's past the Amazon return time, I will follow up with the creator of it and see what they can do to help me and fix it and stuff like that. But yeah, it's just interesting. All right, let's get on to some of that tabletop gaming stuff. More, more of it, I guess. Uh, it's related. That's related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. So uh, this also got mentioned. I don't know when it was. Maybe around the same time. Maybe a few weeks ago. Uh, but it was brought up, and I just didn't have a chance to talk about it till now. But let's see. Uh, they announced uh, the folks over at uh, Hexplore It announced the next volume. Um, I don't know. I guess it's not in here, but there was like a link to it. I got I, I included the link in the video description, um, but they did share some of the theme story and like hot overview of the next Hexplore It. And yes, I still don't have volume four. I, I don't have it. Mine never showed up. I, I don't know if it's still coming. I have no idea. Whatever. Not too worried about it. Um, but uh, they've already announced like the fifth volume and it seems like it's going to be some kind of like tower defense thing, I think. Let's see here. Where, where did I read this before? Okay. Welcome to the first look at our new volume in the Hexplorit series. So I'm sure this will come to crowdfunding in the next few months if it didn't. I don't think it did, right? I don't think it did. But I did save this. Yeah, now I'm not sure. It can't be because it would be here. It would be here. I don't think this is on crowdfunding yet. I just saved the link to this thing. But um. oh, yeah, because they're still, they're still spoiling stuff. I see. Um, But yeah, where was it? As the game progresses, the five elements uh, spiral further out of control. Players work together to restore balance in a deconstructed, deconstructing world. Great areas of land break away from the board and rise to the heavens while the heroes gather resources, gain power, and confront unique and dangerous challenges. Play consists of two stages, the harvest stage and the siege stage. Each of these stages occurs one after the other up to four times per game. The harvest stage spans many months of game time and introduces a new style of play centered on decision making and resource management. Players gather resources and strategically prepare for the coming, next coming invasion. This sounds a lot like uh, that Great Wall game, uh, kind of like Awakened Realms or like any kind of tower defense game. You, you have like the the build up, you know, uh, you build up, trying to build your walls, towers, gather resources, and then combat time, right? And it says sieges, um, sieges closely resemble classic explore it play. So I'm assuming there's minis on the board, you know, maybe you're something tokens and they're coming towards your base and you fight them off in like combats, like normal Hexplorer combats. I don't know. During the siege stage, cataclysmic events, power hungry demi deities and elemental spirits work to deconstruct this reality's pattern. These siege opponents are grand in their scope, comprising of powerful creatures and armies. 
and Jathy, however you say that, uh, herself appears mid-game, oh, that's the boss, okay, to wreak havoc on the land and its people. Can your heroes restore the balance? Will you gather the armies necessary to oppose her? Can you raise enough platinum to bolster your defenders? Or will you bravely stand your ground alone against the terrifying titan of our world? Yeah, it's Tower Defense, M-O-G. What does that stand for? Where was it? Mount The Mountains of Godai is what it's called. But yeah, I put a link to this in the video description if you want to go read more. Uh, but I know there's a bunch of fans of this game on the channel. Uh, so I just thought I'd bring up, yeah, the, it, you you haven't even probably played your Volume 4 or your Volume 1 or whatever you backed on the last Kickstarter or whatever you bought at your local retailer. A lot of people are still getting into this game series. Uh, but they've been doing this kind of loop. So every year or two, they come out with a new volume. They're obviously going to do six volumes. Hex, Explore It, I'm assuming, six volumes. Um, they've done four of them now. One is just delivering on Kickstarter. Uh, by Mary HGJ Designs. These are like adventure games with like dry erase boards in them and dice rolling, push your luck. Um, you know, survival games, um, which are kind of cool. Some combat, um, you know, uh, open world sandbox kind of feel to them. Or it, it is a feel of that. Not kind of. It is a sandbox adventure survival game um, with a fantasy theme or like the, the Transylvania theme or a desert theme or a, a like kind of forest fantasy theme, whatever. Um, but yeah, they're, they're pretty cool games. We played them on the channel. You can go see playthroughs of them, but they just announced their next one, which I, I'm kind of like, okay, are they actually going to get away and break off? And this is going to be very different. Cause like I, I can't in my mind put tower defense with hex explore it. I just don't know what's going on there and I'm excited to see how it goes. Um, but they have, uh, these kingdom tiles, which are larger than standard hex tiles. So I don't know what they're doing here, but if you want to go read all about this, uh, again, I'll 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 look into this more later, but uh, I just thought I'd point that out there. If you want to go look into it, there's you know video stuff, and they're kind of you know e expanding on. Oh, the siege stage coming soon. Okay, so you can read about the harvest stage here, um, which I'm not going to do right now, but I'm just letting you guys know it's there. I I'm more curious uh, about the whole thing, how it works, um, but eventually they'll spoil stuff as they go. So uh, yeah, just letting you guys know it's there. All right, cool, cool. Uh, something that I was expecting to talk about this week but got pushed back is um, I guess Chip Theory Games had to delay. I don't know what they delayed. Something else. I don't know. Things are getting delayed there. But anyways, this got pushed back a week. Uh, 20 strong. Randomly, they just I got an email just saying, hey, there's this small card game that they've announced. It reminds me kind of like the trip block campaign idea. Just a tiny little Chip Theory fun side game they made. That's super drastically different than their giant overproduced. It'll still be overproduced for what it is, but it's more on the lower end. So obviously less design time, development time, usually all that kind of stuff, you know, less production, smaller uh, weight, you know, cheaper shipping, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, they got to have some of these games that, you know, don't sink the ships they're transported on, I guess. Um, but I've linked this also below. You can see the preview page. This was supposed to launch yesterday. I was going to be talking about it today, um, but they just still have the preview page up. It's been delayed till next week, I think, because some of them got COVID going to Essen or something. Um, I don't know how true that is, but that's what I was told. Uh, and what is 20 Strong? 20 Strong is a solo game system of probability, resource management, and risk-taking that can be applied across multiple unique decks with the same set of 20 dice. So I guess you buy 20 dice and then you can buy like expansion decks, extra decks to switch out with different themes from their library. A typical game of 20 strong takes 30 to 40 minutes to play. To play 20 strong, you move through a series of challenges in your selected deck of cards. To overcome these challenges, you roll various combinations of 17 dice with different hit probabilities. Your three other dice uh, manage your changing stats, your hit points, your allotted number of rerolls, and how many rolled dice you can recover each round. If you make it through your deck and defeat the final challenge, you win the game. The base 20 strong game comes with the Solar Sentinels deck, a new Chip Theory Games IP. So we expect, based on them putting a new IP in a little game like this, maybe they're testing the waters, but I have a feeling they're probably working on a large a game using this IP, you know, maybe. Um, but they made a whole new IP for this, uh, for an impending alien invasion. 
There are also two additional expansion decks available through the campaign because, you know, they want to make sure their hardcore fans who came to them through Too Many Bones and Hoth Marcus, they have a reason to back this crowdfund campaign uh, because they have to have it all. Uh, so we got Too Many Bones themed deck and a Hoth Marcus Victorium themed deck. Both decks have their own. Oh, and that's a good way to reuse uh, assets, right? Like FFG does, you know, just make other games in the same uh, IP world and you can just kind of reuse those art assets and stuff that you've used. You know, it makes sense. Like, I would do it too. Uh, both decks have their own unique uh, mechanics that make use of the 20-strong game system while hearkening back to the spirit of the games that inspired them. If this campaign is successful, we will offer many more decks in the system in the coming years. However, for this campaign, there are just two products being offered. The core 20-strong box, which includes a Solar Sentinels deck and the 20-strong dice, and the core rules, and the all-in bundle, which includes all of that, plus the two other Too Many Bones of Victorum. So they're not even letting, you know, just too many Bones fans come in and say, I just want the too many Bones deck and the 20 dice. They're saying, nope, you have to buy the Solar Sentinels one, uh, no questions asked, and the Victorum one. Um, but it's interesting. It's interesting. That's the kind of stuff that helps them pay, get the, like, cheaper shipping going and stuff like that. Uh, because of this simple product lineup, we're able to offer free shipping on all pledges. Uh, that's crazy town. That's crazy town. Okay, uh, the campaign launches soon. I'm sure the price, like shipping, is kind of like in the price, you know, kind of thing. But anyways, it's not truly free. Nothing ever is. Uh, the campaign launches soon. Follow to not miss out. So just letting you guys know, because I know there's a ton of Chip Theory fans that watch the channel for different reasons uh, for the different games. I don't know why, but they do. Um, but uh, this might not appeal to most Chip Theory fans because people love the big overproduced games that have chips in them. Uh, but this one I don't think has chips in it. I think it's just dice and cards. But it is, I think, the nice PVC cards from what I was reading on their website before. And the dice are, of course, custom. So if you're just looking for a quick game and you want that chip theory like quality, um, this might be it. But I have a feeling this will kind of just be similar to the trip lock they tried before with the smaller game with the high, high quality components. Uh, might just be forgettable. I don't know. I don't know. No one ever talks about trip lock. Everyone I talk to just says that. Uh, okay game i played it it's fine didn't inspire me enough to play it on the stream right away or anything one day maybe i'll play it on the stream for fun um but yeah i played it it's okay it's fine it's cool nice little quick game but as you guys see here quick little games is not really my thing um but yeah i am interested i want to give it a try i'm okay to support this kind of stuff i think it's cool it's nice to have a catalog of varied experiences right um you know and it's another gateway kind of product too cheap enough people might try it out and go Ooh, I like what these guys do with their gameplay and their quality of components. What else do they have? And of course, you'll get the little flyer in there showing their other games, you know? Maybe it's a little, little, little gateway into the Chip Theory universe. Uh, but that's coming out next week. Coming out next week. Um, yeah. Successful Geek, get out of here. I'm not answering you. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Yeah, Tolbold saying, I noticed several crowdfunding campaigns were scheduled for the 18th, were postponed to the 25th, Oathsworn scaring them away. Yeah, that happens. That's a normal thing. I, I don't think it's Oathsworn scaring them away. I think it's the general number of games that are were coming out at this time of year. I think a lot of people are trying to get a bunch of money before the end of the year and also figure out what they're working on for next year. So they're trying to figure out what projects, just like any company does, right? They kind of look at the past year, how it's going. They need to find out their direction for next year, you know, maybe get some funding going, maybe um, reallocate resources, hire and fire people, whatever they need to do. This is companies now coming with their project they've been working on all year, maybe previewed at convention season. It's now convention season is like ended ish because Essen and Gen Con are done. Of course, there's other conventions, but those are the big ones. And then usually people go there, they promote their prototype, they get feedback, they go back to the drawing board, then they come with their campaign later in the year. So it's that time of year. People also start spending money. They're online shopping. They're on the internet. They're, they're getting in places where it's not too nice outside anymore. People are going inside. They're spending more time on their devices. So it's a good time to throw campaigns in front of people. The only problem is everyone does it. So companies are like, oh, crap, we really need it to happen right now. So what we'll do is just move it a few days, move it a week. But they're not willing to push it a month or two like they probably should to really avoid some of these other campaigns. But it's really just very crowded right now. Like I was so shocked when I saw the list of games that right now are coming out. Yeah, a lot of them I do not even care about. Not even, not even a thought. 
But I know of even publishers who when Gloomhaven and Frosthaven and these kind of bigger, like real big games, record setting games come to crowdfunding, there are companies that are even making similar games that I tell you guys should push, 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 push. And they're like, yeah, we're fine. We're fine. But then last minute they do chicken out and they back off because it's like they're not going to get the traction, right? People can only back so many things at once and backing and money and crowdfunding is down. Um, so yeah, you got to be careful. So if delaying it a week helps you get a few, you know, extra thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars, whatever it is, uh, it might be the best bet. So that's what's happening. I don't think it's so much for Oathsworn. Oathsworn, I don't think is doing like, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy numbers. I don't think. Right. But I haven't looked at it today. Um, and it's also just a reprint. Um, it's nothing really new. Right. So um, but yeah, lots of Kickstarters coming out and companies will just go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. We'll delay. We'll delay. So maybe even ship theory was like, saw that it's very noisy and was like, we're going to delay, but like we've been sending out a lot of delay emails lately for all of our campaigns. Let's just say for this one, it's COVID. <laughs> Hopefully they're not lying, but you know what I mean? It just seems a little fishy. They're also pushing back their campaign like others have. Right. But they say it's just cause some people got sick. I don't know. Sure. Sure. <laughs> drama drama speculation but yeah uh just throwing it out there link is in the video description if you're interested uh i may talk about it again after it's launched um in a future coffee chat but i was hoping to talk about this today and i wanted to see more i was hoping we could see some gameplay or some rules or something um but no we have to wait we have to wait uh, what do we got here? The Gloom Crew has been a member for five months. Dropping their free super chat. Says, hello. Five months here. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I can't give you that time back, Gloom Crew. I'm I'm very apologized for that for five months. Um, but thank you for sticking around. Thanks for long-term support to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, successful Geek uh, is trying to say that his is bigger. Uh, member for 16 months. Okay, all right. All right, guys. Let's not make this a contest, all right? Um, I always forget to do these. Thanks, Gloom Crew. Oh, okay. It's a nice one. Okay, it's a nice one. <laughs> nice, guys. Nice. Yeah, I don't know how that works. Like, uh, it, it, when you click the super chat button below the chat, does it just tell you you have one to use that's included in your membership? I don't know how that works. Um, yeah, I, I should probably figure that out so I can tell people more of it's a thing, but I just know YouTube kind of like does their own thing on your end, your end that I can't really control. Uh, all right, this one here is called Stifling Dark. Uh, Mel and I saw it at Gen Con. I'll admit I was probably tired, a little not focused when they were presenting this to us. Um, it looked cool, though. I was already like, I like these one versus many. I like the hidden movement stuff. It has these plastic, um, these plastic kind of translucent little flashlights kind of lights, and you can use those to help find the killer. I like the horror theme to it. It really looked neat. Mel was like, all oh, in. Mel's like, we, we need to get this. We need to get this. And I was like, oh, they were just showing off a prototype, and they said they were going to bring it to Kickstarter later, which year it is. Um, so I figured I'd look into it. Mel, Mel actually put this on the list today, so you can blame her for me looking at this. Um, but I thought it was interesting. Um, but yeah, it's one of those like one verse many. I love Fury of Dracula. You know, I like Last Friday. I like the horror theme to this kind of one versus many hidden movement, you know, hiding behind a screen kind of thing. We're looking for the killer, that kind of stuff. I, I think that's really cool. Um, I didn't watch this trailer yet. Let's watch this. It looks like no one's been here for years. Did you see that? I'm telling you, I saw something move. Cora! Cora! Close the door! <laughs> The Stifling Dark is a one versus many hidden movement horror board game with an innovative line of sight mechanic for two to five players. Up to four players take the roles of investigators who have followed local rumors about the supernatural to an abandoned sawmill. However, after making their way in, the gate locks behind them and they quickly realize they are not alone. The final player assumes the role of the adversary, in this case, the butcher. The adversary is hidden from the other players behind their player screen. With a number of attack and ability cards to choose from, the adversary play style can vary each game. Hidden throughout the buildings is the evidence the investigators need in order to prove the rumors are true, 
put an end to their paranormal events and find a way out. With each piece of evidence they pick up, the investigators unlock unique ways to interact with the map and get closer to finding an escape. Once all five pieces of evidence have been collected, the investigators have learned enough to stop the adversary for good. They must now select one. Uh, this font, like this screams, this font is like, I feel like I'm looking at Arkham Horror, like LCG or, or an Arkham Horror board game, Eldritch Horror, whatever, right? That's what that gives me the feel, but that's like gives you that horror feel, right? Nothing wrong with that. But that's the vibe I get looking at those cards. Am I the only one? One of the three ways to escape or fight back. After the investigators take their activations, the butcher is free to stalk his victims. He places a shadow token on the board, giving the investigators a rough idea of his whereabouts. Now that the butcher is done stalking, the investigators take their activation and have to choose between running away or trying to find him. <laughs> Choosing to fight back her fears, she attempts a desperate defense, rolling the sprint die to get into position. Luckily, she reveals the butcher with her flashlight and is safe for now. Will you take on the role of an investigator or an adversary? Remember, the only way to survive in the darkness is to keep your friends close and your flashlight closer. Oh. The Stifling Dark, now on Kickstarter. <laughs> your friends close and your flashlight closer. Uh... <laughs> time to draw your weakness yeah a better dead by daylight board game yeah that's what i'm getting from it yeah exactly it's kind of like last friday like we have a game like this that uh already plays this style it's got the um it's by um aries games go look up last friday if you were looking for a game like this to play at halloween like right now go look up last friday i don't know if it's like in print it's easily to find or not but it was in retail it, it was by Aries Games. It totally rips off like Friday the 13th. You ha It's in a camp. You have camp counselors. Uh, we played it on the channel. We have a live stream of it. A couple of years ago, we played it at Halloween time to show it off. It's like kind of like an unknown. I consider it like kind of like a hidden little gem because uh, it's very well done. I love Fury of Dracula. I do. But it has like um, this. The uh, last Friday has like the Friday the 13th campy theme to it. Uh, you know, camp counselors, you know, uh, running, using, finding items, getting in the boat, going across the lake. Uh, it changes from round to round. One round, the killer's trying to hunt you down. The next round, you guys are trying to hunt the killer down, you know, and try to get the chosen one to take out the killer in the final round, that kind of thing. There's also an expansion that adds, like, uh, you know, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street kind of stuff to it. Uh, really cool game. I like it a lot. It's fun. It's cheesy. It's not too complicated. It's good for a night around Halloween to play. And that's the vibes I'm getting from the Stifling Dark, a horror board game. It's the same idea. It's got the butcher, the killer. Instead of one, the rounds are very structured, it seems. Um, in last Friday, that's very structured. You have like five phases or whatever to the game, you know, and one phase the rules change. You're hunting down the killer. The killer's trying to get away from you. You have ways of trapping them and slowing them down and trying to find them and weapons and things. And then, and then the next phase, they're hunting you, for example, and you got to try to hide in cabins, find keys, all that kind of stuff and survive um it looks like in this you have the choice during the game you know you kind of know where the killer is are you ready do you go after him do you run from him w what do you do um it seems kind of interesting i don't know if it's better or worse than that game but i already have a game like this in my collection but let me tell you that little flashlight mechanic i saw it in person and it made so much sense so all the circles on the board you have to figure out line of sight in this game it matters uh so to quickly i love it gameplay wise how quick it was to just say like hey can i see this space or not instead of counting you know okay count in a straight line orthogonal or diagonal this many space blah 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 here's the mechanics to line of sight in our board game blah 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 you hear it in so many games right um and sometimes it can be annoying oh did it touch the corner of the wall or not touch the corner of the wall i have no idea let me use my little laser to find out right in this it's just super simple just like x-wing you know solve the measurement thing by including templates this includes the flashlight template that just makes gameplay quicker answers the question you just slap it down can i see the space are you in that space you know, you don't have to worry about like, did it do this or is this weird rule? You just know or not, right? And obviously the wall is there to block whatever. Um, but yeah, I just like how how it cleaned that up. As soon as he showed me that at Gen Con, I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of genius actually. 
Um, so you don't have to sit there counting and figuring stuff out and accidentally saying the wrong number and like, you know, messing up or anything. It's like super obvious. It's just highlighted, um, which is neat. Super simple, quick solution. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That's all I can say. If you've ever seen Fear of Dracula, I've ever seen um, there's many of these hidden movement games. Uh, there's one that we just purchased uh, that I hope to play on the channel at some point. No promises, but I just bought it because I wanted it. Uh, Sniper Elite, the board game. It's got the World War II or like military kind of theme on it or something. I think it's just military. Maybe it's World War II. I can't remember. Very confused. Too many games. Um, but it does have a hidden, you're the sniper and you're hiding and there's soldiers trying to find you and you can, it's like a stealthy kind of game. Um, you know, so I do like these kind of games. These ones versus many with the hidden movement and stuff. Um, ML, obviously, because we played these type of games, we like them. As soon as you saw it, she was like, had Gen Con. She's like, oh, I love it. And of course, look, they got the cult. They got some Lovecraft stuff to it, um, obviously, in the expansion stuff. So they have the horror, general horror theme, but of course, you get the cultists involved in an expansion. Yeah, so I'm interested in this one. This one, I'll have to decide about backing it after I look at all what's available this month. Kind of look into the budget and figure it out. But I am interested in this one. I just don't know if we need it because we're already, if I'm, if I'm having this itch to play this type of game... I have two horror-themed games like this to pull out, Last Friday or Fear of Dracula. And even Fear of Dracula, I have it digitally. Uh, so if you want to play that remotely with people or online or whatever, or quickly do it without setting up the board game, you, there's a nice digital version of uh, Fear of Dracula. So like, do I need a third game in my collection that sits and collects dust all year till I feel like playing it around Halloween? Probably not. But it did look cool at Gen Con, I'll be honest. Seeing the prototype and, and him walking through the details and stuff, it, it's something I love, but... Doesn't mean it's for you, but I just wanted to highlight it because I think it's really cool what they're doing. Um, and these kind of games I like. So there you go. But I am interested in that one. I just don't know. Uh, it's just not like a, a automatic back because I've already owned games like this. But it, it, that part, that's the reason why I'm interested in the first place. So I'll have to look a little more in like what it's actually adding um, and then see how much is left in the budget to back it or not. I don't even know how long is left on it. But it also doesn't deliver to like February 2024. And then you have to add like the, um, you know, six to one, six months to 12 months minimum automatic crowdfunding delay. Uh, so we're talking like maybe summer or fall of 2024, you'll maybe see the game. So, you know, maybe they need that much time to work on it. I don't know. But uh, I mean, the prototype looked pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Double sided game board. But yeah, I don't know about that one. Just something that was on my list that I wanted to look into. Mel also was really interested. So, you know, maybe you'll see it on the channel in the future. Who knows? Mel says, might be something we get at retail. Yeah, that's if it goes to retail. I don't know. That's the thing. Every Kickstarter, crowdfunding campaign, whatever, you have to look into it, right? Some of them are like, oh, we'll never go to retail. And then it does anyway. Like, so you can't trust it no matter what they say. But a lot of these smaller ones that are from smaller publishers that only get like a thousand backers and don't make that much money, they usually just print the game, send it to the backers and call it there. They don't want to risk it going to retail because if it didn't have enough hype on crowdfunding, that's also a way for them to test the water, whether it's worth it to invest in an extra amount on their print run to go through distribution channels where the distributor takes a cut, the store takes a cut, you know, and, and there's there's also still shipping to eat up in there too um, and all that kind of thing. So. Um, yeah, if if your crowd, I would be the same way, right? If my crowdfunding campaign barely made a mark, and I barely had any fans interested in it, and it didn't make any noise, I'd be scared to put it in retail, where it might also do horrible. But maybe it's like the perfect game to go to retail, and maybe putting it on crowdfunding is kind of dumb because it's not sticking out on crowdfunding because it doesn't have a thousand miniatures, eighty-five stretch goals. You know, and maybe it's not doing anything to market itself apart from other crowdfunding games, but. I don't know. Look cool. Just another one of those games, but I've been there, done that. So uh, I know what I'm getting into here, but do I need another one of those in my collection? That's where I'm at. But anyways, you shouldn't care, but there you go. Um, you shouldn't care what where it is in my collection or whether I'm interested, but I just thought I'd show that one. All right. Uh, another cool one is Spirit Island. Uh, I've never backed a Spirit Island project. It kind of, I don't know. This, this falls in line with some of the other games. Um, I have backed some before, but some games, I just, they just never stop coming out with expansions like Root, Aeon's End, 
uh I, it's funny it has end in the title but will never end um but yes like like legacy uh or not legacy whoa legendary sorry marvel legendary um some of these games have been around for years and they just keep coming out with expansions they're like perfectly expandable systems that they can just keep making more characters more decks of cards more components uh, small gameplay tweaks mini expansions all this kind of stuff modules to mix in um but they these guys decided to do it on backer kit beta whatever this is backer kit i guess has their own crowdfunding i think this is where like i don't know the next gloomhaven one is going to be or something um kind of lame but uh anyways another crowdfunding platform that maybe won't be around for long maybe will be who knows but they're tired of kickstarter's business so they made they want to get a cut but uh spirit island decided to go there but we all know greater than games is going to bring this to retail it never misses so this is kind of one that even if it didn't do well like if i'm seeing this and it's like oh my god it's not a million dollars or it only has this many backers I just look at this to go, oh, cool, another expansion. I don't even think I have the last expansion for Spirit Island. I love Spirit Island, but no, no offense, they've made too much content for it, I feel, because I just don't have the time to literally focus on one game. But if you are a gamer who loves Spirit Island, and it's like one of your you know handful of games you only play, this game is so loaded with replayable content. It's crazy, and it blows my mind what they've already released for it and what I've already played. And I haven't even scratched the surface, I feel, in the last expansion I bought um, that I didn't even buy the next one. And this one, I'm like, I don't know if I'll buy. And they have that new set that's coming out, the new starter set, like the Jaws of the Lion Spirit Island kind of uh, thing going to Target and stuff. Um, I'm in interested in that one just to see what they're kind of, how they're trying to draw people in to the hobby and into this uh, Spirit Island, um, Spirit Island uh, system, I guess. But yeah, they have another expansion. This is crazy. It never stops. But uh, that's, I guess, good if you like it and you're bored of what you have or you feel like you need more variety. I don't know. But it's like crazy. I feel like I have so many upgrade powers, so many spirits to choose from, so many invaders and uh, or adversaries or whatever they're called in the game, plus events. Um, but they're adding more. They're even adding more mechanics, more tokens. It's like, I don't know. The game, I don't know if it's getting too bloated at this point. I don't know. But for those who are bored of Spirit Island, I'm sure there's a small amount out there who are like, yeah, I need more. Here's another expansion. But I'll be honest. I'm just like, I'll just get it at retail in a couple of years when I finally get to that point. I feel like I need more Spirit Island. But there are completionists out there who just will buy it because they feel they must have it. But um, and maybe never really play with it too much. But it's more of everything. Minor powers, major powers, fear cards, events, healthy island cards, blighted island cards, whatever. But even some more tokens. I, I don't know. More spirits. Um, but I'll be honest. Like, I hear Spirit Island and I, I get excited about the game itself. But, like, I have too much on my shelf. I don't play enough of this game. But some of you out there might not know about it because it's not on GameFound. It's not on Kickstarter. It is on BackerKit. So you have a third platform you need to browse through now looking for tabletop games. Um, but yeah, and Sacabra's Sacabra knows Sacabra being Canadian, like me knows, uh, especially in Canada, you will be able to get this game at retail. You'll be able to get this expansion for ten dollars or more cheaper than what you see it on here for. Uh, what is it? I don't even know. Like, I don't know how to use this one. I'm sure it's just a ripoff of Kickstarter. So, uh, where is it? Pledge levels and add-ons. Uh, actually having extra links over here is, is a better start but this is like feels like just such a kickstarter ripoff they got to stop with this scrolling crap man so dumb but uh anyways um pledge levels yeah 55 dollars for just the expansion so yeah retail probably this will be a 45 or 50 dollar expansion okay i don't care about a little pack of fomo cards that come with it or whatever it is some foil cards whatever but you can get all that stuff if you want there's a premium token pack or something for it um, but I don't care about that stuff, you know. Um, I definitely get tons of value out of just buying the retail box for these games. More than enough value, crazy value. So I could probably get this later, throw it on an order, free shipping, support my local game store, spend $45. But I'm just getting the information out there. If you must have it and you love the add-ons and the exclusives and the stuff that gets put in expansions later and you just want to get it first, um, there's options here. But Spirit Island, amazing game. And if you've never heard of it, uh, they are coming out with a nice, cheaper Jaws of the Lion kind of 
shrunk down version, the same way Jaws of the Lion shrunk down Gloomhaven and made a smaller, cheaper way for people to try the game out and dive in, but it still was complete and full of value, like definitely way worth your money for 50 bucks. They're doing the same thing with Spirit Island. Target reached out to the designers and the publisher of Spirit Island and says, we want you to make a entry level, slim down, a little more basic version of Spirit Island so that, you know, people are just browsing in Target, like, uh, you know, like kind of like a department store. They can find it and maybe it can pull them into the hobby that way. So that's coming out this fall. Um, I will, they said they're going to send me a copy. Uh, I am interested. I want to see what they're doing. I want to, I want to critique it from a person who's played many, many hours of Spirit Island. I just want to see what they're offering, you know, the the maybe the monopoly player the you know like the the people who, do, who mass market board gaming people who maybe will come across spirit island on a mass market shelf you know and what are they presenting to them and, and how is that interesting and then that's a good recommendation of people maybe who like even hardcore gamers who are like oh i was afraid of spirit island maybe i didn't want to spend a bunch of money to try it out uh a cheaper way to get into it but um i think you can even add that on Right here, uh, Horizons of Spirit Island, 35 bucks, you can add it on. So that kind of gives you an idea of the price it'll be. And it's for non-US only. If you live in the US, the only place you can get it is Target for the next couple of years. They have an exclusivity deal. But outside the US, you can buy it through this campaign or through your local retailer when it eventually uh, gets into uh, distribution. But I just thought I'd point this out. I love Spirit Island. It's a game that has a special place in my heart. Amazing solo game, amazing co-op game. Great puzzly game, complex as all get out, brain burning game. I love it. Um, amazing game. Don't judge it by its cover. I made that mistake and didn't get into it as soon as I should have. Um, but yeah, the game is more than meets the eye. That's for sure. Mike says it's thirty at retail. Okay. Uh, oh, for this, yeah, for um, Distant Horizons. Okay. So there you go. Yeah, that's weird, eh? Yeah, there's always an upcharge on crowdfunding, and I hate that the way there was like you beat you get it at M beat MSRP, you get it at less than MSRP, but stores don't sell it at this magical MSRP they make. It's always less. I I don't know what the deal is there, but there is like not just the direct to you shipping cost on crowdfunding that I hate. There is also the extra cost of the sticker price because you're not you're usually paying for all those stretch goals and add-on packs and the FOMO pre-order bonuses that are on Kickstarter, you're paying for those always. That's why it costs more to get a game through crowdfunding before even calculating and shipping. So, yeah. Which is crazy to me that the publisher usually makes more money doing this too. So they're making more profit, but they're, I don't know. It's just a weird way. I'd just rather get stuff through retail. I don't need all the extra junk. I like to support my local game store. Without my local game store, I would have never gotten to the hobby. Uh, I would have never found the games that pulled me in here. I would have never found the players I've met. I would have never had some amazing tournaments, uh, been able to host nights teaching people games and stuff. Growing our hobby is what these game stores do. Let's support them when we can. That's how I feel, assuming they're doing a good job. If they're crappy, unclean stores, the person who owns the store is rude. Uh, they charge way more than they should. They're mean to their employees. Whatever. Uh, screw them. Go out of business. Burn in hell. I don't care. Um, but yeah, if it's a good game store, support them. Um, go in there. Hang out there. You know, without them, our hobby wouldn't be expanding at the rate it is, I think. So, um, but yeah. There you go. That's my thoughts. All right. Now the big one. <laughs> Jonathan says, just bought it for 25 Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> That's what I'm here for, Jonathan. Hopefully I brought stuff up that uh, interests you guys. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Escape from escape from the aliens from outer space makes you afraid. And what are you guys talking about? Sorry, just looking back to see your guys' thoughts. I kind of like was looking at the chat, but I know you guys have our conversations too. Um, oh, Cynthia says don't like Backer Kit as a platform. Mike James says, I have Horizons. The new spirits are fun. Oh, it's out already? Oh, okay. I didn't know if it came out already. I thought it was October or November. I, I, can't, I can't keep all the dates straight. I can't keep all the dates straight. Yeah, eventually I'll get it and feature on the channel at some point. Uh, for sure. I want to see what's going on there. I want to support that kind of product. I even reached out to the company, Greater Than Games. So I was talking about a different game and I was like, oh, by the way, guys, like I love this idea of what they did with Gloomhaven and making Gloomhaven Jaws the Lion. 
you know, better tutorial, cheaper, thinking of the mass market player, bringing them into the hobby, growing the hobby. But even, even as a recommendation, cause like, uh, you know, s telling somebody to back a game on crowdfunding for 120, 150, $200 is like the cheapest they can get in on this massive game. I hate seeing the stories of somebody said, Oh, I bought Gloomhaven cause everyone says it's so great, but it's not for me or my group doesn't like it. Or I just hate it. Set up the gameplay. It doesn't draw me. It's not my type of game. You know, you think they would have done a little more research to find out, but sometimes people don't have any experience to compare it to. So they just think, I'll start there. And the cheapest you can get in at the time, you know, you buy Gloomhaven at a retailer, 150 bucks, you know, whatever it is, um, it's pricey to find out you don't like the game. Obviously, you can play digital now, but even that's not the cheapest. Uh, it is a cheap way, I guess, relatively. But I mean, if you want the board game, but I love the idea of Jaws the Lion taking a larger game, shrinking it down. You only have to go in for 50 bucks. If you're not having a good time, you can stop, you know, give it to someone else, whatever, sell it. I don't know. But 50 bucks is a lot easier to swallow to play a few scenarios of Gloomhaven. And even if it's only those couple scenarios, you know, you still got some value out of it, even if you don't sell it or whatever. But it's just an easier pill to swallow um, to find out you don't like the game or you do love the game. And then from there, if you love it, obviously, then you play the rest of it. And then you got Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, blah, blah, blah. So... I like some of these games that are complex, maybe more expensive games coming out with more entry level, easier to get into good tutorials, even though they all should have good tutorials. Um, but just thinking of the new hobby gamer, you know, getting into it. I think I, I love that idea because at one point you were a new gamer. I was a new gamer. I wish these products existed then so we could easily get into this hobby um, without playing some crappy stuff or spending way too much money. So breaking down the barrier easier easier entry into the hobby is what companies need to focus on a little more um in some of these like amazing games and amazing systems and high production quality products i think that's what needs to happen more yeah billy's saying it's good to have more affordable options for people especially if you want to gift it to others bingo yeah yeah hook them in right first hits free <laughs> uh but yeah Oh, Successful Geek says Spirit Island is 30% off on Steam right now. Uh, but it's a digital version you're talking about, which, again, may not be for everybody. Just look into it first. Um, yeah, that developer doesn't have the greatest track record in my eyes of making digital apps of board games. So I don't usually like to mention their stuff and really promote them here. But, um, yeah, supposedly it's fine. But, uh, yeah, I'm assuming it's playable at least. Uh, mm -mm -mm. yeah Tolbolt says also 25 scenarios in Jaws of the Lion are already enough for some people not everyone needs 95 scenarios bingo yep bingo yeah I, I always thought like after Jaws of the Lion was announced and the way the way that worked out imagine imagine the bank like you think Gloomhaven did a lot of money you think Gloomhaven was the right way to release that game and make money for Isaac at Cephalofair Games or however you say it, Cephalofair or whatever? Everyone knows subscription model and, and getting people, you know, to keep coming back is the way to have a repeat business, repeat customers, right? Imagine Gloomhaven. Picture Gloomhaven never existing. Just imagine Gloomhaven was released in episodic content in 20-ish scenario jaws of the lion boxes that came with like you know the four heroes and then as you went to the next part of the story or the next chapter and it could be standalone they're like kind of separate-ish stories and you could you would like just picture gloomhaven being broken down into like five jaws of the lion size products and you know spread out the classes amongst there so you you know a new one would release six months or a year later and then you continue the story, you know, it leaves on a cliffhanger, maybe or something fun like that, you know, a more interesting story, obviously, um, a better written story, you know, if, if you care, but just the idea of like the same idea of unlocking classes, which had people hooked, but just imagine like six months later, the next episode of Gloomhaven, whatever, whatever season two comes out and then you open up the box and you could bring your characters from the past one in. Or you can pick some new characters, you know, and maybe unlock them through playing those missions. But if it was more like interwoven and, and, and kind of sprinkled it to you slowly and new items were found along the way. But just imagine the amount of money of a new one of those coming to crowdfunding every year. 
for the next 20 scenarios, the next four classes, the next 100 items, the next hidden legacy content, whatever it is. I know the game's not truly a legacy, but you know what I mean, like surprise hidden stuff, stickers and all that stuff. Just imagine Gloomhaven was five Jaws of the Lions, you know what I mean? Imagine how many people would have got into it at the beginning who wouldn't have been scared. And the the the, the barrier of entry is super low. And then if you wanted to continue with it, it was it was more like the LCG, the slower, cheaper release model. People will buy stuff if it's a cheaper pill to swallow each time, right? Rather than having to buy it all up front. Imagine where that guy would be like, he's already doing well. I'm sure he'd be even like, like that would have been the amazing way to do it, right? Everyone get excited when a new one comes around. Kind of like a new show, a uh, new season of a show launching. Everyone's like, oh my God, I played the last one. Like right now, Frosthaven's like, you know, uh, coming out, you know, this year in March uh, or in um, 2020 or 2021, it's coming out soon, right? Um, so when Frosthaven comes out soon in 2020, um, you know, people were kind of rushing like, oh man, I didn't finish Gloomhaven. Oh, I got to go back. Oh, there's so much to play. Oh, too much, too much. But if it was just like, oh, I just have to play the last entry of Gloomhaven, you know, like, would that have been better? You know, and every time you have some upsell stuff on it, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but just imagine that. Like, I want to see a game kind of like, again, you have to hook them the first time. So maybe on the other edge, other side of the coin, maybe Gloomhaven would have never existed. Maybe that first box didn't do gangbusters on Kickstarter because it didn't have a thousand components in the list. It didn't make waves, you know, it didn't pull people in because it was just like a Jaws of the Lion size product. So people were like, ah, I want big epic games, right? Who knows? Who knows? MEP, thank you for clicking the join button down below and becoming a member of the channel. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for the support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But that's an interesting one, eh? Like thinking about that, like what could have been? But maybe I'm wrong. I'm probably wrong. But just imagine like Frosthaven was like that based on the success of Jaws the Lion where it was like, you know, Frosthaven season one is just like 20 scenarios. Here's the thing. They would have got it out faster. We wouldn't be sitting here, you know, three years later waiting for the game to still arrive that we were told we'd get two years ago. Uh, but you know what I mean? Um, but yeah. Brian says, I don't like episodic board games in general. I'm okay making it an intro game like Jaws of the Lion, but I don't want episodic expansions for what should be one game. I can see that. That bugs me sometimes too. Buying expansions and storage and all that stuff. But, but, here's the other cool part about that. What happens if, you know, uh, a big game, you back on Kickstarter for $200, you get it, it's 100 scenarios, whatever, tons of content in there, and then this has happened, this has happened, this is a thing, and everyone gets it in their hands, and the gameplay sucks, and it's full of bugs, and the story's broken, and there's errors everywhere, and cards need a rata, and things just don't work, and people can't play the game because there's typos all over the tiles and stuff, Right? That happens where people get this game, they get all these components, and the game is kind of broken, and they have to house rule it. They have to wait for an update pack and a Kickstarter two years from now. You know, if they wait for the publisher to make an official FAQ and rule on things and answer all their emails. But imagine, like, you just got the first box of an episodic thing like that. That's 20-ish scenarios instead of all 100 and all the expansions and all this shipped to your door. That's And half of it's junk, and you're waiting for the update pack and the new cards to be sent to you. How many games? That's happened for a handful of games I backed. I don't even back that many games. Um, but what they could do with the episodic is get feedback on the first, you know, quarter of the game before they release the next one and fix stuff. So then, you know, the next one, they've already improved it and they, they can kind of make those changes and be a little more agile with it. Right. So that would be kind of neat. I don't know, but then I, I'm not sure if these guys can handle that stuff, but it's not for every game. I'm not saying every game do it, but again, not every game's for everyone, but it would be nice to see something like that. I didn't mind the Lord of the Rings LCG when it was like adventure packs coming out, but Arkham Horror being a connected campaign, obviously it's better to have it all together and they finally fixed that. Excuse me. But that's still episodic. We still get mini campaigns through Arkham Horror LCG products now. You know what I mean? It all just one campaign comes in a box. That's what I'm talking about. Just imagine Gloomhaven was broken down into like those Arkham Horror LCG type expansions with like eight to 10 scenarios, for example, and a few investigators in another box, which is a few Gloomhaven classes. I don't know. 
that game's pretty successful, and, and I think it's neat. Basically, that's what it would be, right? Is Gloomhaven the LCG? But the new LCG model, not just putting one scenario in a pack. That's not... No, it doesn't need to be like that, but yeah. Brian says, I know I wouldn't ever finish a game if they take too long between releases of the game. Brian, have you ever not watched a show because it got delayed because of COVID? You, you just gave up on the second season? Or because they took long because of a writer strike? Did you just never go back to that show? Are you that type? If it takes too long, you won't go back and watch a YouTube video saying, here's how season one went or go and watch the previously on. That's what I picture, right? So even if they had to delay the second episode for an extra year, the second box. Remember, there's players who like don't aren't first adopters too, right? So there are people who maybe never heard about the game. So Gloomhaven blew up on its second Kickstarter. So I'm playing devil's advocate, right? Like, I know what you're saying. You're picturing your world where you're on top of Kickstarter. You bought that first edition. You bought the first 20 scenarios. You played them right away. And you're like, if they don't do the next one in a year, I'm not buying it. But to be honest, you're the minority because most people will wait till that first wave comes out. Then they'll hear about it. Then there's like the reviews come out and the word of mouth comes out. Then the second Kickstarter drops. That's when the game does gangbusters. That's when people buy the first episode and then they like Final Girl, perfect example, right? They release one wave. It did okay. It, it it releases, everyone gets to try it, and boom, everyone's like, we want it. It sells out at retail instantly. People go nuts on the second Kickstarter. Same thing happened with Seventh Continent. Exact same thing. First Kickstarter, it is okay. It's fine. But once people actually get the game and find out it's good and word of mouth spreads, the reviews come out, people start loving it, the ratings on BGG start flying out, then everyone comes in on the second Kickstarter. You know, and of course they'll have upgrade packs and stuff like that. So just remember, like being an early adopter, I know what you're saying, but I think it, there could be some games to do. I'm not saying every game should do that. I'm just saying, imagine Gloomhaven did that and made a bunch of Jaws line. Again, there is a game out there for you. So I, I'm all saying some games should do it. I, I wish they did that with these bigger games to make them more digestible. More digestible. And also not everyone can play a board game every day or every week to even... How many people started Gloomhaven I saw who bought the first Kickstarter, the second Kickstarter, and literally Frostame got announced and people were like, yeah, man, I've had this game for years. I've only gotten through like 20 scenarios. So I think people would probably like a break between entries. Um, but again, everyone's in a different situation. All right, enough with this stuff. Enough with, uh, you know, just dream and pie in the sky stuff. But... Um, Mike James says, I don't like being nickel and dime personally. Trickle content annoys me. The Arkham Horror LCG core box, you use more content, so it depends. So Mike, uh, you don't think you're getting nickel and dime having a, a campaign release here like this that has all these expansions just put in separate boxes instead of inside uh, when you know it, it's all designed and play tested together. So picture like any CMON project. You're getting nickel and dime from all the little extra packs, the expansions that are all right there, you know, the FOMO little add-ons, the stretch goal miniatures, the 24-hour pledge now and get a free add-on miniature. Like you're getting nickel and dime whether it's dropped to you in one Kickstarter once every two years or two Kickstarters in two years. You know what I mean? There's nickel and diming and upselling happening all over the place. All over the place. The only problem is the separate shipping. If you're getting episodic content like that and you're paying for shipping each time, that's the problem. That's where it's a problem for sure. I can agree with that. But again, I'm I'm not buying Jaws the Lion online. I'm going to my retailer to buy that. That's me though. Hey Brian, how's it going? Brian S is here, coming in the middle of a raw brand with the super chat. Thank you so much, Brian. <laughs> no, we're just we're just talking out loud here. Just talking out loud here. Yogi says, I think you're right, Rob, but I don't like it. I just know there's a lot of people that post online and say, I'm not touching Gloomhaven or Frosthaven with a 10-foot pole. It's too much game. It's too expensive. I don't know if I like it. And they don't know about Jaws Line. At least that's a thing now. And But people still, I see, say that. And people say, I I, I can't, I love you too many bones, but I, I even look at uh, Undertow or I'm looking at the core set. They're all way too expensive. I can't even try the game out. And I've talked about this on too many bone streams. I wish they had a little pack that's even more entry level with one gear lock, one set of like a single scenario uh, or like a single uh, tyrant, a uh, mini tyrant, a single run of, you know, maybe 10 uh, scenario cards that you shuffle and you draw five every time you play it. But just a sample, a cheap sample, a nice entryway that could be sitting on retailer shelf, more impulse buy uh, that I could recommend to people. 
Because I can show you a game and play through it on the channel, but like until you play some of these games and get them hands on, some people don't, it doesn't click for them until they actually get to touch it, feel it, learn it, play it, you know, and have to be hands on. So I love companies making these more entry level things for these epic systems. Like, are we all not in agreement here? We want to have more people playing Too Many Bones uh, or more people playing Gloomhaven or more people playing Spirit Island. And, and without those kind of products, less people will play it. That means these companies will make less expansions or less iterations or less games in general. And if you love something, you want more people to experience it because the more successful something is, the more it's going to stick around, the more people will play it, the more people will talk about it and our industry will just grow. So like, yeah. So for someone like Brian who doesn't like episodic content and doesn't want their games like that, you just do like comic book people do or what Arkham Horror LCG people did. Don't be an early adopter idiot if you don't like that model. You just wait till it's done releasing and buy the omnibus with all the good stuff in it or buy the, you know, the all-in campaign pack later or, you know, the all-in pledge that comes with all five installments that eventually comes out when it's all done, you know, or the DVD set later when all the seasons are done, you know what I mean? Um, there's always an answer for that stuff, but I still think the idea of making larger games into more bite-sized entry-level products is the better way to expand these games to other players and get more eyeballs on it, more support, more feedback. It'll just grow the hobby. It's better for everybody, I think. Um, but yeah, except for the shipping. But that's where Kickstarter just sucks, buying things direct. But you can still do it through retail. Still do it through retail. It also helps retailers because that was the thing with the LCG packs and the episodic content and the Magic Gathering releases, the seasonal releases. It's an excuse for people to come back in the stores, right? To keep foot traffic coming in these game stores, to keep people coming back and seeing new products. It's good for the industry. I think it's a good business practice, but maybe not the most consumer friendly. I don't know. But yeah, anyways, there you go. I don't know. That's my rant on that one. Uh, okay. Enough delaying. Enough delaying. Okay. The one you guys want us to look at, the one everyone's talking about right now, the big crowdfunding or not even a crowdfunding project, really. It's just the game everyone wants to know about that we, we need to talk about here. It is Jenga Kool-Aid Edition. So this is the second edition of a game that you guys have heard of. It's a huge game. This is the huge game you guys want to know about that is now back and available, but it's available in a new edition, a second edition, will you? And it's just cosmetic changes, just like the designer said. They were going to rebring this game out, but just do cosmetic changes. Um, but there is some new stuff to it. So you can get um, this game. Uh, it has colors that match Kool-Aid flavors. Anyone who doesn't know what Kool-Aid is, it's basically poison for your body. It is basically water and sugar mixed together and some other unknown chemicals um, that our parents used to give us when we were younger in the 80s, back when they thought cigarettes were cool. Um, and, uh, basically this is uh, how you get diabetes really quick. Uh, you drink jugs and jugs of this. It's one part water to 17 parts sugar. Um, and yeah, but they somehow, uh, rebranded Jenga, which is a classic everyone knows. And they made a Kool-Aid edition. Uh, so this is what the op games, uh, AKA USA Opley, AKA the guys who make a bunch of mass market garbage. Uh, the only game I know of that they made was decent, not made, sorry, sold, and published was a uh, retail edition of Dice Throne. But everything else I get in my email inbox from these guys is on this. Uh, but I, this is the one you guys want to know about. So this is what we're here to talk about is Jenga Kool-Aid Edition for one or more players ages 6 and up is available now for $24.99 from your local. Oh, it is coming to retail. Okay, okay. Oh, you can get it online for those who love buying stuff through crowdfunding and love to put your credit card in online. Here you go. Uh, you can get it through the online shop where you can also find awesome games like Clue the Mystery Game, uh, with the Friends Edition, Monopoly Monster Truck Edition, Monster Jam, um, Labyrinth, you know, uh, Critical Role Clue. Okay, uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, there you go. Anyone who's waiting the whole time on the stream to hear me talk about this game that's coming back out with a second edition, um, there you go. It's just cosmetic changes. Uh, there you go. That's the one. That's the one. Oh yeah. Did they update the rule book? Is that Mike's asking? Uh, I don't, I think they added a new component. There's some kind of track with, so just understand on the Kool-Aid, they like to use pictures of fruit. 
uh, all over the images, but there is no trace of fruit anywhere to be seen. So you see these like grapes and lemons and oranges and stuff. Uh, there is no vitamins, no minerals, no fruit of any kind comes anywhere near the factory that this stuff's made at. Um, yeah, so just, just so you know, there's some shady marketing going on there trying to trick children. Uh, oh, Scooby-Doo Jenga. Okay. Oh, Harry Potter Jenga. Bob's Burgers Jenga. Okay. But we all know Kool-Aid's where it's at, right? So this is what the game industry needed. Uh, so I'm glad to talk about it. Hopefully, I, I don't like to tell you guys what game to buy, but uh, I'm going to, you know, read between the lines. Like, you know, this is the kind of game we play on the channel. This is what we love uh, is this kind of game. So there you go. Yep, Vantage. Uh, Vantage in the chat says, Rob knows his audience so well. Exactly. I know what to cover. I'm not stupid. This is the stuff you want to know. This is the stuff you want to know. <laughs> Edward says, does the Kool-Aid man come running in during a long game? Yeah, he watch out. He does break through brick walls. Um, so be careful. Uh, he might bust through the wall. That might happen. <laughs> Dad, I need this. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. You guys are awesome. Just reading the chat. Super serious. Everyone's so serious. This is all good. Uh, Brian V says, where are the minis? Oh, crap. This is why it's not, this is why it's going to retail, not crowdfunding. They know their audience. You don't put something this awesome on crowdfunding because it's just a bunch of miniature shoppers on there. So you got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm talking to you. You know who you are. <laughs> I was one of you two before. I still am really. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh if you want kool-aid minis uh funko games i believe has a kool-aid expansion for um funko verse and there's also funko pops for the kool-aid man so if you really need kool-aid plastic guys on your shelf uh go check out funko and funko games i think they got that stuff covered but obviously they're licensing this kool-aid license out to the gaming industry and it's i guess a thing all right jokes aside the real game i was kind of leading to was Osorn into the deep wood, the second edition, which they said they were just going to do some cosmetics, but I'll be honest. I'll be honest, a little pissed off, just a little, but I say this all the time, learned it in it. You never want to be first. If you're the first, you're a beta tester. You're getting the worst version commercially available of anything. If you're the first person to buy something, uh, usually, because they will find out issues when things get to the, the mass market and then they'll fix them in the second or third edition or the game of the year edition or, you know, the next year's model of that car or whatever, you know. Um, yeah. Or the, you know, you play that you use some software, you buy the first day pre-order a video game or, you know, you, you download some OS when it first comes out. Uh, yeah, there's going to be bugs. There's going to be issues. I thought Oathsworn, what I've played so far, we've streamed this on the channel. Playlist is down in the video description, uh, but this beast is back. This was a game we late pledged because when I first saw it, generic, big box, plastic filled board game. But as I started looking into gameplay, started reading rule books, started hearing people messing around with it online and stuff, uh, it was supposedly actually a really decent game. And it's definitely something targeted at me personally, my type of game, some story, some miniatures, tactical combat. You know, uh, it basically pulls from all the big kind of miniature filled games, what they're doing right and kind of pulls in as jump in, jump out, basically pleases any game group who wants a shorter play session, longer play session, easy setup, easy teardown, sort of, um, nice save system, good stuff, good game, really good game. The problem is they underestimated hype. Uh, the first Kickstarter did fine. Late pledges, I think were through the roof. Um, but then they brought it to conventions and stuff and the word got out. People started getting the game. This just like, I, I feel like a broken record. I said the same thing with Gloomhaven. I said the same thing with Seven Citadel. There's so many other games like this where just don't back it on the first run. If it's a great game, you'll be able to get it later. Here we are. Here's your chance. So Oathsworn turned out to be just as good, if not better than most people expected. Okay. Uh, I've only played through five of the 21 scenarios in it. So keep that in mind. We played through them all on the channel. You can see every basically minute we've spent with the game live on YouTube, and we will continue. I know people have been asking, what the hell you haven't played in a month? We're just trying to play the other games we have too and show them some love. I can't spend my whole time putting hours and hours and hours into only one game 
when other games are sitting there and they need some love too. So we will get back to this. Mel's been painting it, but she also had to stop painting it to paint three other games. So shove it. We will play it when we feel like playing it, when we have time to play it, when it fits into the schedule. Uh, you entitled buggers. Uh, but yeah, the people are leaving comments on like other campaign series who aren't interested saying like, why are you playing this game? Get back to Olsworn. Uh, I wish I could just click a button to zap you or something. Um, but that I don't have that. It doesn't exist on the internet yet. Um, but yeah, everyone, everyone has their own game, right? So I want to play Osorn, but I also don't want to have my wife, you know, I, I crack the whip too much. She's not going to paint anymore. Right. So I need her to paint at her own speed and have fun doing it. So she will paint these detailed miniatures at her own leisure, but she also plays games with us on the channel. She also works her job. Uh, and she paints other games too. So we will get back to this. Because I stopped after number five doesn't mean I don't like the game. And that's what I'm here to say. So if this game's for you, look into it, do your research. We've played through five scenarios. I think it's like six or seven episodes on the channel because we broke the story out separately in one or two of them. Uh, I unboxed it if you want to see all the components. Go read. But it's back on Kickstarter for the next 26 days. You have plenty of time to research this game. Go watch our first episode. There is no real spoilers in that episode, I don't think. Um, you'll see how the gameplay hook goes. You'll see how the story phase works. Uh, even in the next one, I think I show off the shortened mode. They have like a shortened mode if you want to just like do a Cole's Notes to get through the story part of it, to get into the gameplay, the tactical gameplay in the boss fight fast. They have that mode in the game. I show that off, I think, in our second stream. Uh, but you can find that playlist down below. So it's there. And I like the game. I do. It has its problems. It's not perfect. No game is perfect. No, I've never found the perfect game yet. Um, no game is perfect. But it's cool what they're doing. It's definitely one of the gems in the rough that if the diamonds in the rough, I should say, that comes from these crowdfunding campaigns that are just basically trying to jam as many miniatures in as big a box as possible. They did a good job with it. You can tell there's love and passion behind it. Um, but I did not realize they didn't put enough love and passion behind it that there is a update pack with new rule books and a whole bunch of cards. And you can get that on here by just pledging $1. That will then present you with a list of new stuff if you can add on, or you can add it in the pledge manager later too if you want. Um, but for $1, if you already own Osworn, you back for $1, then you pay $15 for an upgrade pack. I, I, to make it equal to the second edition. I, I was told that they weren't going to change anything with the game, but supposedly there were problems. I don't know what they were, but again, this I, I, it's my own fault. I, I backed the first edition. I don't I don't know why I did. I wish I waited, to be honest, because then I would have just got the better version. I would just backed it now. They said they're going to deliver this as fast as possible. It shows October 2023, so 12 months. They were hoping six, but I guess 12. Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to overestimate and not lie to you and then delay it, hopefully. But I could have waited one more year for Osworn. You can too. There's no reason to go and buy it. If they have an update pack, updating the second edition, uh, $125 for the basic pledge, but I don't, I don't care about it. I already have it. I already played this. It, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Okay. If you want my opinion, I think it's a great game for me based on what I've played, what I like, the values there. But look into it. I'm not going to answer what add-ons are worth it. I literally just have the, the train upgrade pack is the only thing we did, um, which we got from the company. But we did back this. We paid our money for this um, other than the train pack. Um, but yeah, there's an all-in. So that what they've added now, I think, is new. is like new dice, a dice tray, an art book, maps, uh, baggies, like satin or cloth bags instead of plastic. But this upgrade pack, uh, first to second edition print upgrade pack, $15. Fully upgrade set of character abilities. So I guess the character abilities are like unbalanced or need a rata or something. I don't know. I'm sure you guys have already said in the chat. I just haven't really looked yet. One sec. Um, but yeah, this is a, yes, uh, Cynthia says, uh, this is a boss battler. Yes, this is a boss battling kind of adventure game. There's a basically like, a third of your play session, or you can separate them into two separate sessions. But basically an hour to two hours, you will play through a story mode. 
and you will run around on a map. You will make choices. There are other surprises that get added to that mode later. There's things that change it up. There's some interesting twists. The story is cool. There's a voice acted app that has the Game of Thrones actor. I always forget his name, but the Old Bear Mormont actor reading the story, the dark, gritty, Dark Souls-ish grim dark grim fantasy setting uh very well done the maps are freaking beautiful the graphic design is great the art in the game is great the components are good um yeah and it's cool to play through the story part making decisions choices you'll get rewards and things that set you up for the second phase and the second phase is like a boss battler on a map there are npcs sometimes there's big bosses there's little bosses there's um they have their minions sometimes uh, there's other things I'm not going to say, but like, you know, these things we've seen in other board games, but uh, it's what you'd expect. Plus some surprises is cool. There is hidden stuff. You can, there's lots, all the monsters are hidden in these surprise boxes. You could open them as you want, but then you'll just open gray plastic. What Mel has been doing is opening them week by week or month by month, whatever, and painting the next one as we go. And then we play it on the channel. So we know what it looks like, but you don't know the story and what leads up to this encounter, which is super cool. And there are twists. There are cool surprises and twists. And again, we're only five in. Um, I can only imagine how crazy it gets going forward. But it's a solid game if you like that kind of game. I never really played a full boss battler before, but it reminds me like uh, the boss fights I used to do in Dark Souls, the board game, were the best part of that game, right? It's kind of like that. Like it takes the boss fight and it's basically centered around that. But there's like... You know, that'll take a couple hours, but like the story mode is supposed to only take like one hour. So if you do it all in one day, it's three, four, five, six hours. I've seen people in the comments saying our playtime is kind of like what most people's playtime is like, even with the stream overhead. Um, so it takes a while. It's an epic experience. There's a little bit of choose your own adventure stuff to it. Uh, you'll have different outcomes and different things happen based on choices you make, people you save, you help, whatever. Um but yeah, a, a really well done game. Really cool. Really cool. Um, but look into it. You can go watch videos of the gameplay hook. Because again, if you're not interested in the boss fighting stuff and you don't like the line of sight rules and the rolling dice or the drawing cards mechanic, the push your luck stuff, the abilities, the how it works, you know, you're, you're not going to like the game because you're going to have to do that like at least 21-ish times as you play through the story part of it. Um and the story part's not that long, and you can skip it. There is a one-pager version to rush past the story, kind of like how Madara had a way to get through the story faster if you didn't want to do all the reading. But again, this has an app that reads everything out to you, but you don't need to use the app. You can do all physical components. The app is just basically for narration and stuff um, on the side. Uh, but yeah, just go watch our first episode playing it. We play it live on the channel. We describe our feelings, how it works. You won't get any spoilers. You'll see how the game flows. We show off the full character. We show off the mini character. They have a way so you can play it with less players, but you have to play four characters always. But they have ways you can take a full character and turn them into a... I forget what it's called. I forget what it's called, the miniature character. Like The character has only two abilities instead of like a handful of cards. But they basically streamline it to make it super fast to manage like four characters of one person or two two people managing two characters each. You can play one full and one, oh, companion. Thank you, Jack. Jack knows. Jack knows. Um, but yeah, you can make one character like a companion. You can make both your characters companion, all three of them, whatever you want to play this game. You can make it quicker and more streamlined or you can make it slower and complex. The flexibility in this game, I always joke that the designer of this game, um, Jamie Jolly, has no spine. But it's all jokes because he literally tried to please everybody. So, like, it's the most flexible campaign game I've ever seen. Jump in, jump out. Save system. You can switch characters on the fly. If you don't like them, you're not stuck all the way through with the same character. Um, you can level up a character and then switch characters, and they're leveled up to the same level automatically. It takes two seconds to do. Uh, again, you can roll dice. If you hate dice, you can draw cards instead if you like the Gloomhaven card system, you know, that kind of thing. It's not the exact same, but... You know, you, you can draw cards if you prefer. Um, what else is there? There is, again, you can play the whole story mode all stretched out and epic. and Or you can just play the shortened one. You just want to get into the fight. You get into the fight faster. You can shorten your play sessions. Um, yeah, it's really neat. Like, super flexible. It's crazy. All the options here that they put in the game to be flexible for everybody. They're trying to please everybody, which is funny. To me, it's funny. I, I'm like, wow. But then I really wish like every game kind of did this. 
<laughs> so it's like I want to support it because I think it's so cool. I hate campaigns where you're locked in with the same character sometimes. Or a player doesn't show up and you can't play that week. You got to switch the game you're playing because you have to play with their character or else you can't play. So you literally can just run their characters, swap them out. They don't show up. You pick a different character to play with so you don't play mess with theirs. They can level it up later. Um, it's neat. De definitely neat. But yeah, I'm only joking about this finalist Jamie stuff, but it's just funny. I've never seen a game where they're like, yeah, you have a problem with this? Well, you can play it this way then. Oh, oh, you don't like that? You can play it this way then. Like... It's all in there, which is cool. It's it's very very creative, very interesting. Um, it just does a lot of good things. It's not anything crazy like we haven't seen in other games before, but it's just, it's like quality is what I want to kind of put there. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. Good, great miniatures and cool gameplay. The only thing is, I wish there was dual layer cardboard boards for these, but they supposedly would have like increased the cost. They couldn't fit them in the box, that kind of stuff. Obviously, with shipping, how it is, they they had to do what they did to fit it in the box. But I wish there was dual layer cardboard for these things because you're constantly sliding tokens around on them and you could just knock them out of the way and stuff like that. And um, But it's not that big a deal in this game. Not that big a deal. I just, it's the only thing missing, when I get a premium game like this now, I with, with super premium miniatures and premium components, I expect dual layer cardboard if I'm putting a cube and a die and some tokens on there. I, and I expect them to be able to like lock in so they don't not not everyone has the most stable table they play on um you know and it's just even on a game you're rolling dice you can easily knock stuff around it just helps with that i mean it still can get knocked around even with dual layer cardboard but again that's just a cosmetic nitpick for sure but that's the only thing i remember being like wow this is weird is this because i got the basic version but no it was just a thing they did but they debated it it was just because it couldn't fit in supposedly what they said so yeah all the bosses so there's tons of bosses and stuff hidden in here um and that's all i'll say yeah it's a cool game uh there it is for you to get again again it's a game that's like very high production expensive to ship lots of volume to it so this is why you're probably never going to find this in retail because it's like one of those games where it's like the publisher needs to make, you know, they can only charge so much for it. So if they went through retail, they would take their cut, distribution would take their cut, and then they'd be left with like nothing. So yeah, uh, it's your chance. But do your research. You have 20 something days. But yeah, if you like adventure -y, tactical, boss fighty, campaign games, choose your own adventure story stuff. Like there's two books of story. It's kind of cool. Um, you like narration from the, one of the guys from Game of Thrones. Super good narration. There's the optional train box we play with. Mel painted on the channel. Um, yeah. Uh, but they're offering a new secret box. Anyone who's got the first one, don't spoil it. But there is a cool secret gift kind of thing. If you back this one, I think they give you the secret box. Or maybe not. I don't know. But uh, if you want the new secret box, which isn't obvious here that it's a new one. When you back at the $1, you can add this on for $15, you know, if you're not rebuying the whole game, which you're probably not. But they just added some more stuff. Oh, another thing they're doing in this version, they are gluing together. So we complained about it on stream, and we actually had Toby, the um, sculptor for the company, watches our live streams. And he was telling us that this whole push, the HIPS push pin design of these characters, all they wanted it to do it for is so you can switch out the arms and the weapons. But the whole miniature needs to be assembled and it falls apart. They all fall apart. They're annoying. And I hated putting them together. It was super frustrating. Took forever. Pissed me off. Um, and I complained about it on stream and I had the miniature sculptor designer on the stream. It was so fun. Giving me feedback on what the process was, why they did it. But they, they're they doing what I said. And I said it should all have been just pre-assembled except for the damn arms. Like, because I glued it together. Most people glued it together. Why didn't they just come glued together, you know, or assembled? Um, and just have the holes in the arms, but they are super detailed, super high quality miniatures. Um, so either way, it's awesome. I ended up gluing them all together and I even glued the arms in cause I, I don't care about this, you know, Mr. Potato head armory pack, but a lot of people will think it's cool. I think it's cool. Just practically. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with that, but, uh, it's an option, but they supposedly they're going to come all glued together now, except for the arms, which is great, which is great. Uh, so that's cool. That's cool. They listen to the feedback. Uh, let's see. Anything else here? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the miniatures are huge, by the way. 
like you play Simon games with these kind of miniatures, you know, with the regular characters. But then, like, even their main characters are bigger. And, of course, the bosses are insane, some of them. Um, like, the first one, I don't know why they're hiding it here because it's, like, on the box. But I, I think, or I don't know what they're doing that for. But maybe it's just to show the size. But anyways, what are you guys saying? So, Copper's saying, uh, yeah, what are your guys' thoughts on this game, those who played it? Am I, am I like, in the right? Am I, am I, am I weird? So Cabra says we love it. Great fun to have your mini wield uh, what you have equipped. Yeah, super cool. Um, I just didn't want to also get them for Mel to have to paint all those too. And I didn't want them to have them fall out while I play. <clears throat> but I think it's cool. It's definitely cool. Just personally, I'm like, eh, I'm good. But I like the, I like it's an option. And that's what's an add-on, right? At least it wasn't shoved down my throat and I had to buy it like that, which I like. I like that. I like that. Yogi says I glued them. No armory. Uh, one took too many says, or sorry, one took too many. Is it? Or one? Yeah, one took. Uh, it's my favorite game. I love the story. Jack says was a 10. Yeah, Jack, I, you don't even have to tell me. I know you love this game. Jack says 10 out of 10 for me for maybe f oh, for 14 chapters. <gasps> Drop to a 9.5 by the end. Fatigue for sure. But Jack, you played it too quick, I think, probably, right? I know you were binging it. And some of these campaign games get like that for me, too. That's why we take breaks from them and play other games. I used to be like that. I focus on one game, like Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven, for example, we got it. I played a ton of it, right? People are watching it on the channel. They want to see more. But there were some months, even half a year, where I put Gloomhaven on the on the, on the the shelf. And was like, no. Nope. I'm not touching it for a while. Well, it wasn't on the shelf. It was on a table. I never put it back in the box for like two years, but until we had to move uh, or f for a year, then we moved. Then I brought it all back out of the box, put it back on a table. Um, but we took breaks from Gloomhaven for a while, many months, sword and sorcery. We took a year break from continuing that campaign. Sometimes you just need to take a break, play some other stuff. Because the problem with campaign games, I love them. But if you just focus on the same one and you play it like every single night or or twice a week for like all back to back, yes, by the end of 12, 18, 24, 95 sessions, whatever it is, you're literally doing the same game over and over again. Anything will get boring. Anything will get boring. M you know, moderation, take your time, pace it out. That's what needs to be done. It sucks when you come back to a game after six months and you have to kind of relearn it, go through the rules again. It's a little hard to get back into. That's why I wish some of these games had better reference sheets, better tutorials, better rule books. Um, that's why I complain about that stuff too. It's not just for the first time player. It's for the person who puts it down because they're getting over, over, like fatigued on it and they want to come back to it, right? You need to have people be able to get back into it easy. Um, yeah, see, Sakabra's saying, yep, we've taken a small break. We'll be back to it at it soon. Yeah, same here. Like, I, I haven't played it for one month, and I'm getting comments where people are like, it's been a month. Where's the next episode? It's like, what? You never took a break from a game for one month? Like, it's not like I stopped playing games. It's not like I stopped making YouTube content. I'm alive. I'm here. It's just like, I don't need to binge every game. Um, and some games are more bingeable than others, of course. Some stories draw us in more than others. Some hooks of the gameplay loop are more addictive and simpler and less brain burning than others. But sometimes those are also the ones that get more boring faster. So, but yeah, definitely. I, I think, I think the cool part is you get the game. It's got 21 sessions. You got time. Play it over a year, play it over a year and a half, play it over two years before the next one comes out. Like they're working on another game after this, for sure. There's going to be another crowdfunding campaign from these guys next year. Um, so yeah, you got plenty of time to play through this stuff and you know, that game won't deliver for a couple years. So yeah, don't rush it. Don't rush it. A game will still be great. You don't have to play it. It's like, we've gotten in this era with Netflix and everything where n no one's watching stuff on cable TV on Thursday nights anymore and talking about it the next day. Really? It still kind of happens, right? With like HBO and stuff, but we're in this day and age where we consume media at our own leisure. And whenever we want, and if something is great, it will still be great later. If there's a movie I missed from 20 years ago, I don't care. I'll watch it eventually if I want. If there's a show that was awesome from two years ago and people are like, now you got to watch it. Great. I get to watch it all back to back. If I want, I get to watch two seasons instead of have to wait for the second season to drop, you know, like don't feel like the FOMO of like, you have to do everything when it comes out and you have to do it now. 
take a break. Take a break. I think it's totally healthy. It's totally fine. And that's that's the way that's the way I, I'm starting to realize some of these campaign games, like they overstay their welcome when you play them too much in in a single session. You, or uh, like I was uh, the Jaws of the, our um, Jurassic World recently. We played like two in a stream. I can handle two in a stream, but at the end of two play sessions, same thing happened with Pandemic Legacies. Uh, the, I can only play so many games of Pandemic in the same same day or the same sitting or the same weekend. And then I'm just like, N I've had enough. But then a few weeks pass and I'm like, man, I, I miss Pandemic. I want to get back into it. Or I miss Jurassic Park or I miss whatever campaign game, right? Some of them, you just need to take a break. They're meant to be played episodically once a week, once a month, whatever, and stretch them out to give them time to make the next game or to find something else. Like, just enjoy it, right? Just enjoy it. No reason to rush through it. Um, but yeah, you're still just playing the same game over and over again. And of course, it would get boring. Like, what can you do? Uh, but yeah. Mike says, we won't live forever, Rob. We have to play it. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Joseph says, if you binge Tainted Grail in the expansions, it would still take a decade to play. <laughs> it's so true. But still, like, uh, even Tainted Grail. Like, I could only sit there for so many hours and I needed to get away from it, right? Like, you start doing it too much and it's like, all right, all right, all right, I'm done. Like, you just get burned out on things sometimes, right? So, yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting. Jack says, you're probably right. There were a couple of things that were bugging me, which I don't think time would have fixed. Oh, okay, okay. I'm excited at some point in the next year when we actually finish that game, Jack, to talk about that with you. Um, when we can when we can talk about spoilery stuff near the end. Uh, we really wanted to do this uh, to do the story, which is why we wanted to keep playing. Ah, okay. You want to see where it went. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, the story pulled you in. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Interesting. Um, so. Oh, Sworn. I want to do a little poll for those hanging out right now. I'm curious. Oh, Sworn. Uh, did I spell it right? I think so. Uh, own it. Um, backing second edition. Or not interested. I'm curious. I'm just curious. Just just checking who's hanging out. Uh, do you already own Osworn? I put a poll in the chat. Do you own Osworn? Are you backing it on this campaign? Or after the hype, the reviews, the hands-on, the second campaign with its its items and add-ons, uh, are you just not interested? I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Just Just to throw it in. But I will show you this uh, just for Brian W, just to be a troll. Because I, I like Cynthia, but, you know, Brian's Brian. Uh, just kidding. I like you too. Uh, Old Sworn Into the Deep Wood. This is first edition. This came out. Backers started getting this. What was this? Like September of last year. People got to, or no, sorry, not September. Wow. I don't. Even, I have no idea of time right now. Uh, we're we just no. Sorry, backers started getting this in the summer, so like July and August, September, whatever. Uh, it was also at a convention season. A lot of people demoed it at Gen Con, got super excited for it, added themselves to wish lists and stuff. Um, but it's a nine point three rating on BGG. Okay, it is shot up to five hundred and forty nine out of all the board games that exist. In literally in. Uh, we're in October, we're in mid-October right now, and most people didn't get their hands on this till like the middle of the summer, okay? So let's say, let's just say July, August, September, okay? Let's just say three full months. Some people have played, how much could you have played in that time, right? Uh, five scenarios, two scenarios, the whole game, I don't know. But some people are coming in here and rating this based on a few playthroughs. Some people are rating this based on playing the whole game. Some people are just because they just opened the miniatures and they fell off their chair because they were so cool. I don't know. Or they love the narration in the app. But it has got a 9.3. 9.3. 9 
Okay, that is a little crazy, and it's already in three months shot up to 549. I know these ratings are easily skewed. They're not the biggest sample size, but that is pretty nuts. For a game that's this complex, this niche, uh, dark fantasy, you know, boss battling, I don't know. There's something there. There's something there. It might not be for you. This game is not for everyone. But I, I like it's number one on the hotness here on my left. Uh, I have it open right here. It is number one right now on the hotness, obviously because it's on crowdfunding. But even if we looked at this a month ago, it probably was still on the hotness list somewhere. But that means people are interacting with the page, going in the forums, talking about the game, you know, sharing pictures, videos, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's kind of like a big deal. Um, but it's not for everybody. But if you like dark fantasy, you like the idea of a boss battle, you like miniatures, you like surprise boss boxes, you like the story, you like narration, uh, like voice acted professional narration, um, like the theme and the mechanics, if the the like, you know, line of sight, combat, all that stuff is for you, the, take a look at this game. Like this might be the game for you. Just look, just look, please look into it. It's, it's worth the look. But there is something here. There's something here for sure. Vantage with the super chat says, Toward Jenga Kool-Aid. Can't wait for the stream. Oh, God. All right. Listen here. Uh, Vantage. Uh, that was a joke. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> I know you're joking, but I hope. I don't want to support Jenga Kool-Aid or Kool-Aid Jenga or whatever it's called. Oh, yeah, edition. Um. Because I, I don't need them spending time making those kind of games. But uh, that was just a joke. That was just a joke. All right. So that is uh, Oathsworn. I mean, I'm getting messages about this. Uh, there was fears. Somebody messaged me saying they thought I stopped playing the campaign on the channel because I didn't like it anymore. And they were wondering if they should back it. Look into the game. I've played enough of it on the channel. You can get a taste of it. If you want to watch the first four episodes, you'll see there's some cool stuff I was told to not judge the game till I played at least through chapter four because there is some twists and surprises that happen, um, which is neat. That's all I'll say. Don't watch it if you don't want spoilers. Um, but there is surprises, not just pulling monsters out of a box, which is cool. I, I thought it was really neat. Um, but the story is well done. It's a quality game, what I've played so far. But please keep in mind, I've only played five chapters. Probably a good enough taste of the game. It's a many hours. Brian with the super chat says, more for Jen Jenga. All right, I see what you did there. Stop, guys, stop. <laughs> I appreciate the support, though. But I'll be honest, that is not going towards Jenga. Uh, okay, let's close the poll. I can't, su I can't support that, guys. I already put it on my YouTube channel. If one of you guys bought that Jenga, that was more than of you than I hoped would buy that Jenga. I just wanted to show it because it was lols. I got it in my email inbox. And I was like, really? Like, they're just blasting out these emails. They don't even care who they're to. But this is not the kind of game I need in my inbox, but I thought it was funny to bring up. Um, There's a lot of garbage out there. But again, Jenga's fun, of course, for kids and stuff. But I don't like the idea they're marketing like very unhealthy stuff on basically a children's toy. I think that's shady practice, to be honest. But to me, it's all jokes. But it's it's not really, you know. All right, let's see what you guys are saying. Um, Old Sworn, backing second edition, 38%. Not interested, 33%. And own it, 28%. Thank you, everyone that voted. I was curious. Okay, so it's kind of the mi a mixed, kind of a third either way. Like you're divided th in, the, in the thirds, like equally, almost, kind of. Okay. Uh... I am very impressed by those who are backing second edition. You're great. That means you didn't bite on it the first one. That means you didn't buy some eBay marked up secondhand copy. I am impressed by you. The fact you've waited and you waited to see if the game was good and you're deciding to get in on it. Maybe you just didn't hear about it till now, but that's good. That's the kind of, that's smart, smart stuff, right? Wait to see how it goes. That's what I like doing. Wait and see, right? Sometimes I'll bite the bullet and back things early to try them out to hopefully put some more information out there for you guys to see if you like it or not, you know, just to show the game off. But, and people who aren't interested, that's totally fine. No game is for everybody, but this is just the game everyone's talking about right now. Uh, I already have it. So like, I'm kind of okay, but if anyone's curious what I'm going to do, I'm going to back at the $1 pledge, which a lot of people are because they already own the game. So there's 5,479 people backing for $1 
But even when you back at $1, it, right away it presents you with a kind of like um, pledge manager options where you can add on like the new dice, the dice tray, the map pack, whatever you want, the upgrade pack, this new secret box. So if you're the one thing I was surprised to find, there is a new secret box. And then the upgrade pack kind of pissed me off. I am going to probably buy the upgrade pack, but I don't know if that's stupid because I'm already on scenario five. And if we play it like say twice a month and that, that upgrade pack realistically says October, 2023, maybe that upgrade pack is going to show up March of 2024. I'm assuming I'll be done playing the game by then either a, because I just stopped and I don't plan on going back to it or B because I finished it and I'm not going to go back and restart it. So honestly, I'm pissed off for two reasons. There is already an upgrade balancing improvement rule book and pack of cards that make the game a second edition. WTF, kind of pissed about that because I felt like they delayed the game so much. I, the reason why, one of the main reasons I backed it in late pledge was because of on one of the videos, they talked about how much play testing they were doing. So much play testing, had so much feedback. We're refining the systems, fixing things. And I was like, man, they're putting all this delayed effort into fixing the game not just trying to avoid high freight costs like a lot of publishers were doing although they did do that they did avoid the highest of highs of the shipping costs and a lot of companies were making up excuses to delay because they couldn't afford to ship their game uh, or they would go out of business so they just would delay it um but i like the effort they were putting in and the game i got it's playable it's a fine game i'm just surprised to see that they've been working on this upgrade balancing pack like i'm not in all the discords and the fan groups and stuff following along what the hell was wrong with the game or whatever but um but yeah why why is this and and the problem is uh, this upgrade pack should be something they ship to me right now i i want it now like w w get it to me so i can play it with my game what i like why is this 20 maybe it does come earlier i don't know but i'm assuming i have to wait till all the other stuff is done and they ship it together right i don't know I don't know, but it pisses me off. That that pisses me off. Like, And it's like, okay, you have an upgrade pack. I'm glad you're fixing your game. That's good. Keep improving. I'm all for that. But I have to wait till probably March 2024 because we have to add that Kickstarter six-month delay to it that always happens um, to get an upgrade pack. I probably don't need it by then, so I probably won't back anything. But my initial instinct was like, crap, I'm going to need those new cards. But then that makes me not want to play the game I have, right? It gives you that feeling like you're playing the inferior version, even though it might not really be much. Yeah, Daniel, exactly. Daniel's saying you feel like you have a lesser version. Exactly. So I'll be honest. I, I read that there was an update. All they said, we're going to add some cosmetic things to bring it back to crowdfunding. No new content, really, gameplay-wise. But to me, putting an upgrade pack in and new rule books. Like, what the hell is that? So I, I was very offended, kind of pissed off, but um, I'll be honest. And I was like, kind of like ranted a little bit off stream. I was like, I might just not play this game anymore until that pack comes out. But then I want to play the game more. And does it really change that much? Who cares? Like, do I care? Do I care? Maybe I'll just play it. But it's like, why didn't I just wait and back this version? Why did I late pledge for the other one? What was the point of that? So now you kind of understand why I'm like, when I see a game drop on Kickstarter for the first time, I go, eh, I'll wait on it. When it comes out, I'll find out if it's any good, and then I'll just back on the second Kickstarter. If they don't have a second Kickstarter or I can't buy it at retail, that means the game probably sucked, or the company doesn't know how to do business properly, and I just won't play the game, but who cares? There'll be a thousand other games I can play instead and totally forget about this one. So who knows? But uh, yeah, the game I have is still good. Obviously, they're improving it, I think. So yeah. Yogi says, I don't think it's a rebalance. I don't know. It said something about tightening up the characters. I think balance was mentioned. Uh, where do I find this information? Let's check the FAQ. Uh, let's see. Tell me all about the new stuff for new people. Let's see. Um, I didn't find the answers exactly what it is. Uh, is there a difference between the first print and the second print? Yes, we have listened to the feedback of the 10,000 plus backers we had in the first campaign and have committed to updating the rule books, many cards, and half a dozen chapters that could be tightened up and improved. What does tightened up mean then if it's not rebalancing? 
All of these improvements will be available physically through the upgrade pack, and we also release an errata digitally that will be free. Ah, so this is like bugs, errata, fixes. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not saying they shouldn't do this, John. I, I want every company to fix their stuff and make it better. And again, this is why I say, like, being an early adopter sucks. It does suck. Like, yeah, you get to play something before everyone else, but it's like you play the worst version. I know it's probably still a great game. This does not change that, but I'm just saying. I'm allowed to rant. I spent my money. Um, But I wish they kind of listed, like, what is this? Like, exactly. Like, how many cards are you changing? Is there any kind of gameplay changes? Is it just cosmetic? Are you just changing icons? And are you adding more cleaner just rules text? Or are you adding new rules? I don't know. Does anyone know? Let's see. Oh, Jack says because they have a big FAQ. Ah, okay. Would be nice if we could just have it already. Maybe at end of campaign they'll do it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, if they're just taking the FAQ, like you get what I'm saying? Like if they know there's fixes that need to be done in the game, they already know these fixes by now. Maybe they just need to play test them, but it shouldn't take that long to just reprint cards that have been updated and just add the FAQ entries to the rule book, you know? And that should be something that I could come on here and order right now and have shipped to me in the next month or two, right? Like, I, I don't know why it's this not here. Like, they're just, I don't know. I don't know. Not impressed. But they're really here just to sell more copies of the game. That's their priority is new customers, right? So I understand why it's not really detailed that well and very obvious. Because it also might scare away new buyers if they see there's update packs that might might tell them that, oh, your game had problems? How do I know that this version doesn't have problems and I'm not going to have to find a second update pack for the third campaign later, right? It's like admitting you you screwed up. And, but yeah, that's, I think, good customer service and communication to be more open but it's right here so yeah it just shows like a whole stack of cards in counter boards and two rule books and it brings your first edition version up to second edition standards I agree, Successful Geek. Every game has problems, 100%, right? 100%. I'm not saying it's not a bad thing. I just wish there was more information about it. Own your own your mistakes, own your improvements, right? Show that you're supporting your game. I love to hear companies that are like, yeah, we support our game. We listen to feedback. We are always improving. You know, we're, we're not just bringing out a new campaign and ignoring our stuff from the past. I like that. I like that very much. Yeah. I don't know. Anyways, maybe they'll add more information. Maybe they'll add an FAQ entry going into more detail about it. But they're charging 15 bucks for it. Maybe it's in here. Mm. Well, they have some contests going on. Anyways, whatever, man. I might just back nothing and just play the version I have. And when I'm finished with it, whether I get to scenario 10 or 21, whatever, and I'm done with it, I'm done with it. I don't need another pack of cards to fix things up. It'll be too late. It'll be too late. But if they offer it digitally, I'll look at their FAQ and stuff before each scenario now, knowing that there's that kind of stuff. And hopefully they get that done quicker. But yeah. Oh, J JW says, Shadowborn posted on BGG about two hours ago. Oh, get out of here. Get out of here. You are awesome. I know I sound like a whiny baby and I'm like feel entitled and stuff, but it's like, I don't know. I just expected more info there. Um, but it should be on the campaign, not in here. What am I looking for? In the general? Call for digital second edition rules? Okay, hold on. Hi, I'm backing for the upgrade kit. Still, it would have been nice if Shadowborn Games made the revised rules available digitally for people eager to play the first edition now. Bingo. 
Yeah, you need to kiss the ass of the people who made your game possible. Like, prioritize the people who already gave you the money, right? It's like cell phone companies that have, like, new subscriber plans, but existing customers don't get those deals. Only the new customers do, unless you call the right number and complain. Um, but, yeah, it's that whole idea of they only care about the new customer, not the existing customer. That pisses me right off. This is not that. This is just them being a small company and being kind of dumb with it, but maybe not. I don't know. We are currently releasing all the new rule books and errata doc for free online soon after the campaign. There you go. Soon after the campaign. Uh, but that doesn't mean like right after the campaign. That could be in three months, six months, a year. <laughs> That's not too clear. There is, uh, I've read enough um, company jargon. Soon. TM. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> soon <laughs> you know you know <laughs> uh after the campaign 2029 <laughs> anyways the game's cool you know look into it and they could do better we'll see all right Uh, Matthew, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Mel and I have been talking about that lately. Mel's only been painting games for not too long, right? There are some games she's painted we still want to go back to. But there are some games that we probably won't go back to and we just have to accept that. And uh, hopefully later this year, we're going to go through the collection and kind of get rid of some stuff. So I do get rid of games. I give them to family and friends for free. I do it all the time um, to clear out the collection because I'm kind of like don't want to go through the effort of selling things online, packaging them, shipping, uh, shipping them out of country. I've done that before. It's kind of a pain in the butt. Even shipping within Canada is a pain in the butt. Um, I've debated like in the future, maybe next Gen Con, I line something up where I post to our, our Discord or whoever's going to Gen Con, maybe even online in some Gen Con forum or Discord saying, I'm coming to Gen Con to save everybody on shipping costs and, and stuff. I'm going to load my car up with all the games that are painted and games we're done playing, and I'll basically sell them there or, you know, deliver them to people, like sell them online, but deliver them. I've debated bringing them to the, um, the auction at Gen Con and seeing what we can get for them there. Or putting them into the um, the uh, the auction or the um, there's the other thing there. Sorry, the little store they have there that's at the place where they do the auctions. Um, I debated just selling stuff online through eBay, some of that stuff, but w w that stuff hasn't come up yet. Like we've never been in that situation yet where we're like, okay, we're 100 percent not playing this game. It's all painted. Let's get rid of it. But we will do it. We will at some point do it, and obviously we'll let the fans of the channel know first um, if we're going to do it online. But yeah, I just don't know the best way to do it. Um, that's why I don't run too many contests and stuff and giving away things because it is a pain in the butt to ship stuff from Canada through customs to other countries, especially larger board games and things. And there's duties and all these taxes and crazy overhead costs to it. Um, even within Canada, it's not the cheapest. But um, what was I going to say? I do love when the publisher says they will send stuff directly from them to a winner of a contest that works for me because then it's kind of like the idea of like you know instead of me and some publishers have done this with me actually they said yeah i'll send you a review copy then they look in the cost of shipping it from their country to canada and they go how about this are you okay if i just go on to an online canadian retailer and buy you a copy of the game and send it to you from there and i say you do whatever you want because they're like it's actually cheaper to do that than for me to box it up uh, fill out customs, ship it through customs, pay taxes, pay duties, all that stuff. They just order it online from a local Canadian warehouse or retailer. Um, so yeah. So I don't know what to do about that. Yeah. I don't know what to do about that, but that's what we got to figure out. So yeah, Matthew, we've talked about that before. I don't know what to do about it, but yeah, this is a tough one. That's a tough one. But I could do something where just people in the Discord, anyone's going to Gen Con next year, maybe, you know, if you're interested, I'll post in the Discord, like, here's five games we're looking to get rid of that are, like, we're done with or painted or whatever. And if you want them, they cost this much, and we'll meet you at Gen Con, you can get the game. Nobody has to pay for shipping. I don't know. And then you get it handed to you. No, no chance of it being damaged, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think that would be kind of the best way. 
<laughs> How much to protest outside of Canadian parliament, parliament and board game shipping duties? But that's on anything, Yogi. Shipping, you know, being, I mean, in Australia, right? Anything. Like you buy something from the U.S., it's it's crazy. Um, you know, stuff coming from China still has you have still have to pay duty and taxes and things on stuff. Um, but obviously, there's better agreements between certain countries where you don't have to pay extra. All right. Now that's not the big game I'm excited about. Okay, there is a game, and this is not a joke. This was going to be a joke at first when I saw this game, but this is the game right now on crowdfunding. I'm actually backing. I'm deciding what to back, but I'm actually super excited about. And this is not just because I live in Canada and it's not because the Canadian government's making me do this. And it's not because I, I grew up in Canada and played this sport as a kid, but trick shot second edition. I had no idea what trick shot was. I didn't know there was a first edition, but when I went on crowdfunding this week to see what was out there and I saw this damn trick shot game and it's cover, I was like, this looks silly. But anyone who's played ice hockey on the Nintendo entertainment system back in the eighties, this has that vibe written all over it. The large players, the little players, the faster players, the heavier players, the silliness, but also the seriousness. I love hockey. Of course, being into board gaming, my new hobby and my job has pulled me away from watching the Pittsburgh Penguins uh, games on TV or in person. Uh, I've been to many hockey games. I grew up playing ice hockey at the local rink in the park sprayed down with water snow snow as the boards you know playing in the neighborhood i played when there was no snow i played roller hockey on tennis courts and on my street as a kid uh i grew up in a house of five six children six children uh so we had a whole hockey team with my brothers and my sister and we we literally the kids in the neighborhood would knock on our door. We'd bring out the two nets in front of our house. Everyone have their roller blades or roller skates on. We get out the hockey sticks and, you know, block the sewers on the side of the road. And we play hockey in the street. And it would be our family versus the neighborhood of ragtag misfits that would make up the other team. And then in the winter, we'd play at the local rink. I would go play at uh, rinks with friends. I had brothers who played organized hockey. Um, yeah, I, I love NHL hockey. But this, is, that's like the only sport that I'm like closest to. I played basketball also uh, in high school, but uh, it didn't, I didn't connect with it as much as I, I did playing hockey. But uh, Carolina Hurricane says Daniel. Nice, 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 nice. Um, but yeah, I'm a Pittsburgh Penguins fan since I was a little kid. Always looked up to like Mario Lemieux, Yarmir Yager. Uh, Sidney Crosby's cool. Um I used to work at uh, Tim Hortons uh, corporate where he does like sponsorships and stuff. So I have like autographed stuff from like Wayne Gretzky and and uh, Sidney Crosby and Marlon Mew and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, um, we have the Hockey Hall of Fame is uh, a few cities over in Toronto. Um, but yeah, hockey is hockey is ingrained in my my life. And when you're in Canada, it's kind of a big deal. Um, but I love hockey and this game. I've never thought I needed a hockey board game, but it also gives me vibes of those old hockey tables. I don't know if anyone knows them. Um, uh, hockey table. There's like two different versions. There's these ones. Okay. These ones. I don't know if you were a kid and you own these. If you you grew up in Canada. Uh, okay. Um, but yeah, this one, uh, this toy here, it reminds me of this. Uh, or where's another one? Uh, you know those ones like in arcades, right? That um, they're like bigger than those. They have like the dome on them. Like these ones, these ones, man. I used to play these in arcade. Uh, okay. <laughs> Man, uh, $4,400. Holy crap. <laughs> Why can't I zoom in? Why when I hover over to get smaller? That doesn't make any sense. But anyways, you guys know what I mean. I, I didn't know there was a need for hockey in my life and tabletop gaming to cross. Um, But there it is. There it is. Uh, there it is. So uh, it has 1,478 backers. I've not backed it yet, but...
but Mel and I were talking about it today about backing it. Uh, you can get a unpainted edition. Look at this thing. Like just, I don't know. It, I don't know. I've always looked into sports board games like, uh, what was it? Blood Bowl and... Um, I've seen people play these games at my local game store and I always thought it was fascinating, but none of them were like hockey, right? They all mimic like football or soccer and all this kind of stuff, but I've never seen a hockey game before and I never thought about it either. I never thought like, man, that's what I'm missing. But when I saw this, I said, this looks stupid. This is a joke, right? But then I read some of the material on the game. This game is not a joke. It looks silly. It's trying to be funny with the hockey stuff. But the folks that made this game, there is a mode of like uh, a lighter mode with less rules, quicker to play, like one period. You can play it in half an hour. Then there is the full advanced rules. And my God, every time I read a new rule, I was like, these guys know hockey and this is how you make a hockey board game. I am not joking. I am super excited for this damn game. It has, uh, all right, you can play, uh, so you can get pre-painted with these miniatures, so physical components, it's got the custom dice, you can get an unpainted set of the game and paint them yourself, whatever teams you want. You can buy extra sets of unpainted teams. You literally could be a psycho and buy the whole, like buy a, however many packs, I don't know how many NHL teams there are now, or whatever hockey league you're into. But you literally could be crazy. And, and if I had unlimited money, I would be this kind of crazy guy. But I don't have unlimited money in time. But I do know people like this that keep spreadsheets, run fantasy leagues, all that kind of stuff. You could buy a whole bunch of unpainted sets of this, of these uh, miniatures, buy a whole bunch of unpainted teams. Where is it? I will show you. So you can get it painted or unpainted with little snap-on bases. Or you can buy additional unpainted teams. But I know there's some crazy person out there that will do this, and I think it's hilarious. But you could buy and paint every single like NHL team. And there are rules for little tournaments and stuff, supposedly. I haven't read them exactly, but supposedly that's in here. To play like a draft variant where you can change the arena you play in. Based on the arena you play in, that changes the hand of cards you have for your lineup. The lineup mechanic reminds me kind of like Fury of Dracula, where both players have the same cards in hand, but you're kind of like playing your lineup card, which gives you a special ability while that lineup is on the ice. Then you can switch lineups and play a different card, but until you've played all the cards in your hand, you don't draw back the rest of the cards, except for if you use a card that draws them back. So if you see on this arena card here, you can play cards with the trait opportunistic, punchy, cool-headed, and bold if you're playing in Washington. But if you're playing in another arena, it will have different keywords. And from those keywords, you will draw different lineup cards and those are what you'll be playing with that game. So each game is variable and you'll have different powers basically, you know, that allow you to play like a different style of hockey kind of. It's neat. Um, there are also, uh, this dice mechanic. So every time you want to pass one of these wooden pucks, and I like the way they put two in there in case you break one. Um, cause you know, it's slap hard slap shots. Who knows? Right. This is not a flicking game. Okay. When I saw this, I thought for sure it was one of those dexterity flicking games that I would play for 10 minutes, hurt my nail, lose interest, and it has no depth to it. This is not a dexterity game. This is a, a real tabletop miniature sports game but it's accessible. Again, there's an entry level mode you can play to learn it and then just play more casual. But there's this whole like hardcore play with play it again with different powers. Every um, player on the board position, they have different speed, stamina, abilities that they can do. Um, how it kind of works is you, my understanding is uh, when it's your turn and there's periods that count down in time along the side of the board, uh, you can see kind of in the background here, you can play three periods, one period. There's a referee token that tracks the time. So as one player finishes a turn, you move the time marker down. Then it's the other player's turn. On your turn, it's got this cool stamina mechanic to it where uh, if you want to make a move or a pass or a shoot or a clearing shot or a start a fight, whatever, it's got all the mechanics for all of it. I was blown away. I didn't think it would go as deep as it does, but I got to give them credit. I cannot wait to play this game. 
uh, just based on what I read about it, uh, being a hockey fan and a board gaming fan. Um, but this is the most exciting thing. This is the reason why I'm doing the stream today. It's not Osworn, just so you guys know. I'm a selfish bugger. This is what I'm doing it for, okay? Uh, so that's why you're seeing the passion come out here. But uh, if you want to do any of those um, abilities, uh, so you, it's your turn. You do a face-off. You roll off some dice for it. Based on who wins the face-off, you take possession of the puck. Now it's your turn. You have the puck. It's in your possession. If you want to pass it, shoot it, move with it, you take some dice to your dice pool. You roll those dice. Based on the results on those dice, if you get blanks, I think it is, it's fine. The pass happens. You pass it to the player you want in a straight line or diagonal, orthogonal or diagonal, uh, unless it gets blocked by another player. You take the shot, whatever it is. There's different types of shots. You can clear it down the ice. You can do slap shots. You can shoot the puck within the offensive zone. All those roll different dice and have different mechanics and results based on what's going on. And the more stuff you do on a turn, you're not allowed to do an action with the same player, I don't think. You're allowed one action per player on your team. But as you keep doing actions on your turn, you add more dice to your dice pool, increasing the chance of you failing. Very similar to Oathsworn, how you add dice or cards to your draw. And if you pull like your blank or whatever, you know, two blanks, you fail. It's that kind of mechanism. But it goes even deeper than that. Uh, where is it? It goes even deeper than that. For example, on a pass, if you pass, your first action is to pass. You just roll like one die, for, let's say. I don't know exactly what it is, but let's just say you roll one die. Just an example. And you roll a blank. Pass is fine. You pass it along the along the, the ice to your opponent your, or to your other player, your other your winger or whatever, right? Now you could roll that one die and it rolls an X. The pass still goes. But your turn now ends, and now it's the other player's turn, and time ticks down, okay? If you pass, you're successful. Then you go to pass with that other player. You now roll two dice, so your odds keep increasing that you're going to fail, and your turn's going to end. But let's say you roll pucks. For each puck you roll, because there's puck symbols on the dice, the pass overshoots, and it goes that many spaces past the player you're trying to pass it to. And there's even mechanics that if it bounces off the board going diagonal, it does like a mirror reflection off in the same direction of how many pucks you rolled. Or it will bounce back in a straight line if you shot it directly at the boards and it passed the guy and came back. And for every arrow you roll, after you're done with your pass, whether it was complete or overshot or undershot, whatever, um, I guess not undershot, I guess it would be only overshot, but it could bounce back to you. Like if you rolled enough pucks, your pass could go off the boards, pass the guy you're trying to pass to, and then bounce back to you. Um. But you're literally moving it space by space. You'll see the squares there. This, again, is not a dexterity game. You're not flicking anything around. You're not, you know, um, measuring with your units and and based on their unit, you're doing this, whatever. But they do have individual unit, like, stats. But it's, it's more simple than that. But for every arrow you roll, that means after you're done your pass, the opponent can move one of their units that many spaces for arrows so they can react to your pass. Okay. It's crazy the amount of, of it, like, you look at the box, and I was like, man, this is going to be a joke flicking hockey game with, like, miniatures for no reason, you know? It's not that. These are game designers that actually put some thought into this to make a sports game, but for the tabletop gamer. It, it's cool. Um, but this is the second edition. They supposedly fixed the first edition. There's an update pack for this one if you own the first one. There are also mechanics for fighting. It's just simply rolling off dice, kind of like uh, anyone who plays too many bones. It reminds me of just kind of like a simple thing, like a dangerous darts kind of idea, but not the exact same, but just the idea of grabbing three dice. Let's roll off based on the symbols. Uh, there's the hit mechanics. You can hit other players. Obviously, a little guy can't take down a big guy, but a big guy can hit another big guy or something like that. Um, there is dice mitigation. So see these um, players down here on the left in the um, on the bench? You have three tokens on your bench that if you want to re-roll your dice, you flip one of the tokens over. So you basically have three re-rolls between line changes. So obviously when you change up your line and get new players on the ice, they're fresh. So you get your re-rolls back. Your players come on. Your dice pool shrinks back, right? So the cool part is if you leave the same lineup on the ice, your dice pool keeps growing, which means your risk of missing and failing and your pass not being precise, your shot being off, uh, your hit maybe not being successful, your move maybe being a little sloppy. Even if you score a goal, if you keep the same lineup on the ice, it's still your turn. You're still in possession of the puck if you win the faceoff. 
but you still have to keep pushing with the same stamina on the same bigger dice pool, which means the same risk of being sloppy, right? And losing the puck or whatever. Um, but it's really neat. So even in the offensive zone, there's a different type of shot you take with different right dice, um, different dice rules based on the symbols you roll when shooting on the net. If I do a shot from behind the blue line, I now have to add extra dice for every line I cross. So if I shoot from behind the red line, obviously it's going to be a very sloppy shot because I'm going to have to roll more dice and has more odds of missing or whatever. But you can do ice clearing shots just to get it out of your zone. Like who would have thought to put that in a board game, right? Like that's something in hockey. That's something you play in hockey video games and hockey in real life. Sometimes you just need to dump the puck down there and get it out of your zone. Kind of like uh, in football when you just do a... Um, what is that called? When you just punt it, right? When you just punt it, you're like, screw this. I'm not going to risk it going for the first down. Let's just get rid of the ball. Get it out. Get the pressure off. Get it out of here. Uh, they have mechanics for that in the game. Again, there's advanced rules to the game, and there's like basic rules to the game, which is kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. From someone who knows hockey, uh, this kind of was like really cool. But I could still play with my kid, and it's accessible enough. But uh, as a nerdy board gamer, it still has all what I'm looking for in it. Um, what else did it have to it that was kind of tricky, um, that I thought was neat? Oh, it has like a dual, um, a little score counter for home and away. And, uh, it's just like a, a dial, like we've seen in all the games, but to keep score on a little dial. And, uh, yeah, there's tons of cards for the lineups. And again, every time you play in a different arena, you have uh, a hand of different cards for your lineup and different abilities. So if you decide to play like, uh, you know, my home is, um, you know, in Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh arena, you play with these certain cards. But when I go to your Washington arena, we play with these cards. So it's like I have to then adapt to that play style and those abilities, which is neat. And you'll see on the character cards, they have speed and um, speed and like, uh, I think, weight or something. Where the hell is the information I want? Out of play right here. It's a game of ice hockey. To win, you need to score the most goals. To do that by performing various actions with your hockey players, such as moving, passing, hitting, making slap shots, and rolling the dice. You can activate as many players as you wish on your turn as long as you do not roll a fail result, which is the red X. The more actions you perform, the more dice you roll increases your chances to fail. You can mitigate luck by spending one of your three stamina tokens. That's the, you know, your players on the bench. Uh, stamina is restored by performing a line change, which ends your turn. This And, and when you end your turn, you the time progresses, right? So... The more you turn over the puck, the faster the period goes. Oh, the other thing is you can get penalties. Penalties. I think based on the hit, what you roll, certain symbols, enough symbols will cause a penalty. And that puts, even if you fight, both players go to the penalty box and you put them on that time track on the other side. And as the referee, as the time counter, he moves down, eventually he'll free them back into play. We saw that in uh, Sky Tear, um, a game we played on the channel before, where like heroes get put on this time track off to the side and they're kind of like, stuck until they can come back into play or whatever um which is neat it's like it's such a cool design for that um but yeah i just i forgot about the penalty stuff but yes yeah, so you can get penalties i it's a cobra i'm telling you man I, th like they went further like if i told you to design a hockey board game that was accessible you would cut out a lot of that stuff right like you would think like let's just make it light you know some shooting and passing mechanics some skating mechanics and make the game short and light they do have that. That's in the lighter version of uh, the simplified rule set, right? To learn the game or to play it that way. But yeah, they put in mechanics. You can play the more advanced version and it has everything basically in the game for, you know, face-offs, fighting. Uh, I don't think there's offsides though, but I wouldn't put that in either. Obviously, if you played NHL games back on Super NES or Sega Genesis back in the day, you could always turn those off and most people did, right? Um, I didn't because I'm hardcore. But uh, yeah. I don't think there's offsides. I don't think there is... Um, what was the other thing I read? Was um, I don't know if there's zone face-offs. I, I think there might only be center ice face-offs, but, I mean, that's fine. Um, but maybe that was when I was reading about the first edition. Hmm. And the central part of the game is a push-your-luck mechanism. If, it turn, if your turn ends because you failed an action, you won't be able to restore your stamina by making a line change. Ending up with no stamina is a sure way to get in trouble. One of the results on the dice is a reaction. Rolling those results grants your opponent a small bonus move in the middle of your turn. That's the arrows. This keeps the players engaged. Then there's four player types. A defenseman, a center, a winger, and the goalie. Oh, here's the card. I was looking for this. Uh, each player type has two primary attributes. Speed determines how far the player can move. And size determines how hard he can hit. 
All of this is displayed on the corresponding player card. In addition, players have unique player abilities that add further asymmetry to the game. You can read more about player cards as well as arena cards here. Uh, oh, you can play on Tabletopia. I missed this when I scrolled the page before. So you can actually try before you buy, but I'm a psycho. Uh, I'm a sucker for what I've read and the hockey theme. I need, like, I don't have a game like this in my collection. I don't even have, like, a simulated sports game in my board game collection. And this will probably be my first, I think. Yeah, I don't even have, like, racing games or anything. I need to find a racing game, too, at some point. I was researching those a few months back. That's a genre I just don't have in my collection that I want to try. Um, but, yeah, sports are the same. I've been looking for a sports game, but I think this may be the one for now. And they got the rule book right here. I love it. Rule book. So yeah, let's look. I want to see. I didn't read this yet, all of it, uh, but I was looking at some of it. Um, where is the part I was thinking? Uh, okay, so look, there's shoot and there's slap shot. So there's like two different shoot mechanics. So let's go down. Yeah, oh, arcade mode is what it's called. Arcade, classic mode. You can play with more than two players, but obviously it does the two team split thing. To me, I'm just ever going to play as probably two players, so just keep that in mind. But there is rules for playing more players. Mm. Oh, there's also a neoprene mat, but this might be the first game ever where I said I don't want a neoprene mat because then I lose that shiny iced like surface of the, the glossy finish on the on cardboard board game boards um, present. So I kind of want to play it on a cardboard board because otherwise the neoprene mat isn't shiny and that, you know, come on, man, you're playing on ice. Uh, yeah. Uh, moving. So, so like a move, right? Even though you roll the red X, you don't fail the move. You just kind of end your turn, but you still get to move, um, which is neat. Successful pass, failed pass, clear ice pass. So the shoot action. Well, so I just want to show you an example of like, it's not that deep, but it's just clever the way they thought about how to make it different. Like, it's not that boring. There's only one type of pass, one type of shot, right? At least in the standard game, I guess. All right, so the shoot action lets your puck. How do I? Let's just make this bigger. So the shoot action lets your puck carrier score a goal from your team by shooting the puck into the opposing team's net. The player making a shot must be in the offensive zone and able to trace a path of squares orthogonally or diagonally. So obviously a player's in your way uh, on the opposing team or your own team. That's going to block your shot or the goalie, I guess, too, right? Uh, to one of the three squares in the opposing team's net. I just love the square system. It's just simple and it works, right? Announced to your player, uh, or sorry, announced that your player is performing the shoot action. Do not move the puck yet. <laughs> uh, the shoot action cannot be, if the, or sorry, the shoot action cannot be performed through a square occupied by another player. If the puck carrier is not in the offensive zone, if the puck carrier is behind the goal line, Mm -mm. no trick no trick no trick uh putting the puck on your stick and then uh, lifting it up and putting it over the goalie's shoulder from behind the net that's not a thing in this game i'm sorry maybe in the expansion um uh if the puck here is behind the goal line if any of your other players in the opponent's crease oh <laughs> so, yeah, goalie interference is, is in the rules basically Successful shot. He shoots, he scores. If you roll no X symbols, your team scores a goal. Increase your score by one on the score tracker. Skip any reaction moves if the goal is scored. Reset the board. So resetting the board is just going back to center ice, setting up for the face-off. A failed shot can result in one of the following two outcomes. If one or more fail symbols is rolled, but not a single puck symbol, it's a save. The goalie becomes the puck carrier and your turn ends. If in addition to one or more X symbols, any puck symbols are rolled, it's a rebound. Oh, so cool. The goal is not scored. The puck changes direction before entering the net and continues moving one space for every puck symbol rolled. I love the rebound mechanics and, and the, the like the bouncing off the boards with the puck. I think it's so cool. Or overshooting a pass just by adding another symbol on the dice. I think it's so cool. If the shot was diagonal, the puck bounces diagonally. If it was shot orthogonal, the puck bounces back orthogonally. 
The bouncing puck can go through players. Yeah, so neat. And then there's the slap shot. So the slap shot action lets players take a shot at the net from outside the offensive zone. This is performed in the same way as a regular shot with the following exceptions. Slap shot is a difficult action. Cannot be performed by checked players and cannot be re-rolled. Oh, okay. The shooting player is outside the offensive zone between the offensive zone and the red line. Mm, okay. Oh, and that's it. Okay. Oh, there's a poke action? I didn't know this. You can poke. You can hit. Penalties. Yeah, see your guy goes on like the little time track in the penalty box. You can fight. Power play. Yeah, buddy. If during the turn, a team has more players on the board than the other team, not counting the goalies, the team receives the power play advantage. Once per turn, a team with the power play advantage may make a free re-roll without spending any stamina. Oh, man, this is sick. Uh, this makes me want to boot up some old NHL on the Super Nintendo. Play some NHL 94. Oh, man. Oh, man. Offside move. Oh, there is offsides. <laughs> there is offsides. Oh, my God. Pulling the goalie? You can pull the goalie. Be careful when you pull your goalie. Can be dangerous. Um. Wow. Oh, here's the rule summary. Oh, here's a reference. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm in. I want I want to support this. All right. So what can I back? I can back. Trick shot second edition pre painted. Uh, well, I I don't want to see euros. Who are these guys? Let's see. Let's look at the Canadian dollar. Ah, I'll put it in U.S. dollars. I'll put it in U.S. dollars. Uh, so eight eighty seven fifty three US for pre painted. Okay. I mean that's not bad, right? It's Twelve pre painted miniatures. I don't know. Is that good? I don't know. Uh, if you own the first edition, here's your update pack for fifteen bucks. You get a lot less for your update pack than you do for fifteen bucks of those one, I guess. <laughs> Uh, or you could get the second edition if you paint. You can just buy an unpainted edition, and if you paint, you can paint your own teams, which I debated doing. The only problem is, like, I really want a Pittsburgh Penguins painted team, like black and yellow or whatever. I must have that in this game. So I debated saying, let's buy the unpainted edition and paint the other team as, like, the Toronto Maple Leafs or something, just to make fun of them the whole time. Uh, just for the losing team, so I always know I can beat them because they suck. Uh, or maybe the Montreal Canadiens, you know, someone else who sucks. Um, but, uh, I'm only kidding. Shots fired. Uh, but, uh, you can just buy these sets. So uh, you can buy an upgraded referee token instead of the cardboard. You can have a little referee at the side of the board. I must have that. This is must have. And since it only costs like three ish more dollars, I'm not going to make Mel paint it. So I'll just pay $3 to have it, I guess, factory painted or whatever. But what I think I'm going to do is buy the base game painted. So that way I have a nice painted set I can just play right away. That has a red team and a blue team. Nothing wrong with that. And Mel could even paint and change some colors, add some logos, add some character to it. You know, make it more NHL-y, if that's a word. Um, but I definitely think I'm going to buy an extra set of players so that Mel can take her sweet ass time. And I'm going to pick an old Pittsburgh Penguins jersey, something cool from the 90s or 80s. And I'm going to make sure I have a little Yarmir Yager and a Peter Nedved and a Mario Lemieux. And they're all on the team. And, you know, uh, who's like the best goalie that was on the Penguins that I like? Um, oh, who's that goalie that went to the Vegas Knights? That that was yeah, he was awesome. I love that guy. Uh, I forget his name, but anyways, uh, yeah, I'm not best with names, but uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, 
who are whoever are Penguins fans or NHL fans. Um, but I want to make my own little Penguins, and I'm not gonna be able to do it. But Mel could probably do it. Um, so I want my own little Penguins team, Pittsburgh Penguins, black and yellow. You know, I want them on the ice at some point. So, and I want to support this project. So yes, I don't need an extra team. But then what stops me there? Do I just buy a whole bunch of teams and make every single NHL team and then create a playoff league and we just play it every day? No, I'm just joking. But you could do that if you wanted, which is crazy. Oh, Marc-Andre Fleury, right? Yes. Yeah, Locator says Fleury. Yes, Marc-Andre Fleury. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So Cobra, don't give away my secrets, all right? Those are my secret NHL 4 plays. NHL 94 plays. I just love one-timers. I love one-timers. Those are my favorite. Trying to line those up, baiting the players to the corner and then passing it out and doing a one-timer. Oh, something about that. So addictive. Yeah, that, that NHL 94, yes. <laughs> but yeah, this is the most exciting project. I know you guys are probably like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? But I already own Oathsworn. I already own too much Spirit Island. I haven't even got the last Explore it. But all these games I'm mentioning, I'm interested in all of them. But this is the real one I want. And you know why? It's because it's something I've never played. It's something new. Something interesting to me. Something I don't have in my collection. Pulls a little bit on nostalgia. But also pulls like, you know, another hobby that I've let. I've kind of let fall into the background. I've kind of ignored it for years and kind of miss watching hockey, miss cheering on a team. I miss playing it too. Um, but it was definitely ingrained in my childhood um, and growing up and just hanging out with friends and even going to watch friends hockey games and stuff like that. Um, spent a lot of my youth in arenas. Uh, my stepdad even like coached hockey and stuff. Um, but yeah, I even helped coach hockey. I even helped coach hockey a little bit um, for a bit. Um, but yeah. Barrasso. <laughs> I used to collect hockey cards. I'm looking at cards on the screen. I used to collect, trying to collect sets of hockey cards when I was a kid. I buy those sticker books and sticker in, you know, the stickers. When I was a little kid, those like, uh, you know, those, you sticker the hockey players onto the scene and stuff. Yeah, I remember that when I was a little kid. Yeah, having brothers all played hockey. You know, we, we had little mini sticks play in the living room and stuff. Yeah, break, break stuff in the house, get yelled at by the parents. I even bought one for my daughter when she was little. We used to play hockey in our kitchen, banging stuff off the dishwasher, you know, banging trick shots in the little little nets on our on our floor. Um oh yeah, uh Edward, just uh the rule book is linked here. I I skipped over it. Um, but the rule book is right here on the campaign. Do I still have it open? Nope. Uh nope. Uh right here. Yeah. Uh it's right at the beginning of the rule book. I mean, I can just bring it up here. Playing with more than two players. Trick shot can be played with more than two players with the following changes to the rules. Players split between two teams as equally as possible. If one of the teams has more players, the more experienced players should be on that team. Players on the same team must alternate activations, not turns, and reaction moves. Players on the same team share the dice pool and stamina. Players on the same team are not allowed to talk with their teammate during their turn. But in hockey, you yell out and call to your teammates and stuff. If they do so by accident, the opposing team may either refresh one stamina or make a reaction move. That's weird. I don't know. This to me just sounds like, here's how I would play this with more players. Since it can be played one period in like 30-ish minutes, you can play a quicker game. It even says right here, you can play arcade mode even. And play it suited for playing with younger players should take 25 to 50 minutes, okay? Let's say you play in an hour. The standard full game takes like 75 to 150 minutes, okay? Here's how I would play this game with more players. I'd create a little tournament for the afternoon or the evening. And I would just say, your team, winner plays, the you know, the, the person on the side plays the winner, you know? Or set up a little tournament. I would probably buy two copies of the game if I wanted to play four player. No joke. I'm not joking. I would, I'm would. i crazy like that. I would buy two copies of this game to have them set up on two tables in the same house or whatever, same room even. And I would just play two players playing off and then swap and make like a little tournament. I'd make a little tournament. I think it'd be hilarious. 
but yes if you want if you it'd be probably good to play with kids though have have like you know uh two kids play on the same team so they can kind of work together but this whole rule of not communicating i think that's just to keep the game moving so you're not sitting there and getting an analysis paralysis and then letting the other team know your moves um because if the other team hears your plans right then they know how, how to react to it um but yeah spencer says could play for the robley cup yes <laughs> hockey dibs on Sidney crosby yes buddy <laughs> I've done that before. I, I've coached kids and, and helped uh, kids in, in soccer and, and uh, hockey before. Um, yeah, yeah. I've done that coaching thing. Uh, and the referee thing. I've done the referee thing. Uh, yes, fighting parents off that don't like my, my calls that on their children who are being little, little poop heads. Yep. Yep, yep. <laughs> That that'll being a teenager refing uh little kids and teenagers uh and having the parents at the game, that will strengthen you and grow you up and mature you real fast when you have to fight with uh passionate parents on the sidelines. Yeah, that's a good time. You you get thick skin. You definitely get thick skin. That definitely prepared me for the YouTube life. I didn't know it, but that helped me for the uh criticism and, and stuff, putting yourself out there. <laughs> I, I have up I have a respect for any referee of any sport. Uh yeah. Dealing with the players and the t and the parents and the the coaches and oh my god. <laughs> yeah, Heather, uh it was it was after I was finished, yeah, that stressed me out more than I thought it would, but I need to make money those summers, so that's what I did. <laughs> uh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that definitely shaped part of me of who I am. <laughs> yeah, or those those summers. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, what else is going on? Anything else? Anything else on crowdfunding? I noticed everyone kind of left after the Osworn stuff. You buggers. I'm just kidding. Um. Yeah. Uh, let's see what's on tabletop gaming on um. And if you if you want to go here to Kickstarter and just look at tabletop games, I have this link that just filters it. I'll post it in the chat. So if you just want to browse here and kind of look at stuff along with me, I don't know if there's anything else that was interesting me. Wait, what's this? Fantasy Dungeon Crawler game with a companion app? Well, those are words I'm familiar with. I don't know who Corvus Belly is, though. Okay, let's open this in a tab for a sec. Wonderland's War. I remember there was some talk about that before when it was on Kickstarter. There was hype behind it. I never, I never heard much about it after. I feel like Sacabra has this one and maybe said it was good. Sacabra says a coworker is a ref. Many years ago, he did games on reserves. Then after a bad game, he actually got death threats and never went back. Uh, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, I almost, I remember there were some games where I, I left thinking I was going to quit. And then I remember my boss and people from the organization, like, contacting me, like, asking me, like, please don't quit. Like, please, please keep doing it. Please come back next year. Please, please, please. Like, don't let these people get to you. You're doing a great job, blah, blah, blah. Like, I can only imagine the cost of, like, psychiatrists from that, that doing that job like children adults whatever it's like it's stressful for real and it did not the pay didn't match the stress that was for sure but again like when you're a teenager just looking for make money like it was cool to be outside being active and the cool part is you'd only work for like the length of the game which is kind of neat right like you don't have to go in for an eight hour shift and so i guess it was kind of decent i don't know it was weird i made decent money i remember like for a summer job it was cool and yeah, you'd only like, yeah, I'd just go for like, maybe uh, there were tournaments though, where you would have to ref all day. I remember that. But sometimes it was just like on a weeknight, you just go for like, you know, a couple hours and you're done. Oh, okay. So Cover didn't have this. I'm thinking of something else, but anyways, never mind. Okay. Forget that. <laughs> Janice, it's <laughs> a job. 
Well, uh, Sajak is here asking, hey, hello, Sajak. It says, what are we backing today? Janet's ratting me out saying Rob is promoting Kool-Aid Jenga. All right, listen. We don't tell people who show up late to the stream what my my back of the week is, okay? That's my um, uh, my pick of the month or whatever. My award-winning pr project. Please, Janet, don't give don't bury the lead or whatever you call that. Don't uh, don't let the cat out of the bag or whatever. How dare you tell him? <laughs> well, he's probably like, what the hell is going on here? He follows the wrong channel, that's for sure. Secrets, secrets. Sword weirdos? What the skirmish heartbreaker? What the hell? I can't even click on half this stuff, but there's probably like amazing games hiding behind here. Dreadful meadows in the heart of darkness. A dynamic, strategic, and immersive survival horror board game filled with nightmares and your... Okay. Like, what is this? I don't know, man. I don't know. That's not... Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know if to even spend time on this. Co-op... A co-op player game. For up to four players. Playable as a solo, too. Like, what, what are the mechanics here? Where are the mechanics? How to play. Solo or co-op. Yeah, we got that. Uh, in this turn-based game, your protagonist, your character, will collect various possessions around multiple locations on the island, fight horrific creatures. <coughs> Excuse me. One sec. All right. Um, learn ancient rituals, communicate with other players, solve mysteries, find a way off the island. Each player has a number of actions per turn. Choose to take their turns in or any order appropriate for a successful round. I like that. At the same time, the players can't communicate unless they're on the same location. Interesting. Or they use one of their precious communication tokens. This makes the game more challenging and doesn't allow alpha gamers to take control of the game. But it's co-op? I, I don't know. Okay, sure. So you get to craft traps, invoke rituals, find possessions, try to stop creatures from advancing to the heart of darkness, engage in deadly combat with them. By crafting and setting traps? I mean, that sounds cool. Find a way to escape from the island, make it out alive. Mm, escaping from an island, you say. Gameplay and preview video. Mm, I should probably watch that later. Baseboard, map of the island. This gives me the horrified board uh, vibes. Very basic, but not, not a bad thing. Simple items. Man, this game seems very light-ish. Which is not bad. I'm just saying, like, when you look at the cards they're showing off and they have, like, plus four dice on attack, regain one health. You know, three stats on a character card. It's going to be pretty simple. Yep, roll some dice. I don't know. Feels kind of generic. Right? I don't know. This feels kind of generic. Not deep. I like the theme. I like what they're saying on the, on the sell sheet. I don't know. I got to look more into this one, but maybe I just don't care, to be honest. Whatever. I don't know. Is there a rule book? Is there a rule book? Do you have your rules available, please? 
I probably should just watch this playthrough video, but I'm not going to do it right now. Um, but I'm always interested in like the horror theme. Of course, it's that time of year. This is a perfect time to put a horror theme game on crowdfunding, right? Is around Halloween, October time, right? It makes sense. Makes sense to me. But there's time. There's time. I just don't know who are these guys. Six created the mongrel. Let's see. Art of Darkness print and play. Okay. Dragons of, or sorry, Dungeons of Dragmar. Yeah, they haven't really like print and plays to, so it's like they do a print and play and then they do a full board game of the print and play. Is that what they're kind of looks like what they're doing here? Dungeons of Dragmar, I guess was their previous game they did. Uh let's let's do this. Let's do this. Let's find it on the BGGs. See see if anyone's even talking about this thing. Well, it's uh it's it's down there. Best with one player. Yeah, it's like only 31 posts. Mm, love this game. It has such great potential. Potential. So it's like not great. It could be better. Is that what you're saying? One review. Some early thoughts from 24 days ago. I guess it just like delivered probably. Somebody passionate enough to go review the game uh, says it's a 6 out of 10. Has some fun ideas, but execution leaves much to be desired. Yeah. I don't know. This is not the game I'm looking at, but I'm just seeing like their track record, right? Like, do they know how to make a great game? Mm, they haven't proven that yet. They have not proven that yet. So this is probably one where I'd be like, it looks so generic and so light. And if I want this horror theme, I have way too many games that I have not played enough of. Mansions of the Madness 2nd Edition, Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, The Last Friday I was talking about, Fear of Dracula. I know those are all different games. They're not all co-op, but Eldritch Horror I should play more of. Elder Sign. I don't know. Arkham Horror, the living card game. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. It looks very generic, but like, I mean, I like the horror theme. It makes me at least click it. Gloom Crew says a lot of co-op games have alpha game of problems. I believe that. I believe that. But sometimes it's fun just to work together and let someone kind of take charge. Like if that's a dynamic of your group, that's how it is. If you don't like that, you don't need to fix the game. You need to fix your group. And if you're the alpha gamer, maybe you're just a solo gamer at heart and you need to step back and let people take their turn. But that's that's something that's like ingrained in people and can be like learned and they have to realize it's a thing. So I think the fix there is to tell the person who's alpha gaming that you may not want to play with them unless they find a game that doesn't let them alpha game or to stop alpha gaming. I'm not sure that's up for game designers to fix. I feel like that's a group problem, but that's me. So John, I love, I love when I see someone alpha gaming and it's not me. Like I usually feel like I have the role of running the game. I'm usually teaching new players or players that don't feel confident. Um, that don't have as much experience in board gaming. So I the problem is I bring a game to uh, like family or friends' homes and everyone at the table just stares at me like, okay, what do we do now? I'm like, guys, I taught you the rules. I walk you through a few turns. It's all up to you now. I'm, I'm part of the team, but I love it. It makes me feel like a proud parent when I see a gamer get the confidence to take charge and, and kind of run the game or run the round or, you know, figure out the solution and be very like, I love when there's some argument at the table about what we should do. And we just put it to a vote or a die roll if that's the case. You can always solve the alpha gamer problem. You can just put things to a vote. But I love, like like Sajat saying, uh, when Mel was alpha gaming in like this war of mine, it's because she's passionate. She loves that game. And I love to see that. I don't mind taking a back seat and just going along for the ride and kind of chirping in here and there, you know. Um, someone in the group needs to be a leader. Every comic, TV show, movie that has a party trying to adventure or solve trouble or survive the night, 
someone always has to step up and take that leader role, right? So alpha gaming, I think it does suck if you're playing with a player who alpha games, but that's you suck because you're not speaking up. Fix the problem yourself. That's what I think. Damn it. That's what I think. But yeah, if you're not having fun playing a board game, speak the F up. And tell that gamer to shut up, let you make some decisions, uh, take turns making decisions then. But then just don't play those type of games or don't play with that gamer or or speak up. You know what I mean? But I don't like this idea that, oh, it's a problem in, in co-op gaming. I've seen that argument before. It's like, no, just play it solo then or find a different group that doesn't mind working things out. Like you just find the group. I know there's groups that I shouldn't play certain games with. That's part of the hobby. There you go. That's my thoughts on that now. <laughs> that could change. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, what's the other one we opened? This one. Anyone know anything about War Crow? War, War Crow Adventures? I mean, it has more support than that last game we looked at. 12 days to go. Here's the problem. Here's the problem I see already. I see they're promoting an app. Here's the problem. You have a company like Fantasy Flight Games who's done the app thing in board games many, many times. And still, to this day, they can't release an app that has no bugs, that doesn't need improvements, that doesn't get patches for the next year or two trying to fix bugs in it, and that doesn't delay sometimes, right? So the part that scares me and, and how many board games we've seen re released recently where the app isn't finished, but the board game is, or vice versa, okay? What's that one, My Father's Work? I saw that game got delivered, but nobody was able to play it using, like, the full app yet because they didn't get it ready in time. So when you see an app-driven game, I don't know who Corvus Belly is, and maybe they've made a thousand games. Maybe they're a huge company. I, I don't know what they do, but I'm just scared because I've never heard of this game. And they're telling me I'm going to have this in February 2024. I think the app will be a problem. Uh, do they know how to make apps? Are they going to make the app on time? Is it going to be bug free? Am I going to back this and get it? And then I'm going to be stuck and not be able to play the game probably because the app's not finished. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know. This is a little scary, but uh, let's see. Who are these guys? They're from Spain. They've had, oh, they've had three projects. Uh, Infinity Defiance, 5,000 backers on their first one. These guys have to be doing something else. Oh, Corpus, it was a Corpus Belly. Oh, Corpus Belly equals infinity. I don't see a crow in War Crow. The lies. Uh, let's see. All well, the Gloom Crew says, I was grateful my father's work delivered before the app was ready. Gave me the time to read the rules and look over everything before I got to play it. Mm, okay. Looking at the glass half full. I like it. I like it. Positivity. Um, I, I respect it. I respect it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, okay. Can we, can we search, how do we do this? Uh, let's do, uh, oh, right here. Corvus Belly has more than 20 years of experience with design and creation of games and the manufacturing of highly detailed miniatures. Are these guys like a tabletop miniature, like tabletop war gaming? The main product, Infinity, is a miniature war game about futuristic combat in a sci-fi setting. At this moment, Corvus Belli, or Billy, uh, has an active community of more than 20,000 players from all over the world who receive continuous support through the different communication channels offered by the company. Okay. Why is your box very blurry? Is it because I'm zoomed in? I don't know what's going on. Reset. Uh, okay. 
October 18th. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Who we are. Sales and distribution. Wait. Infinity. I know what Infinity is. This That was a tabletop miniature game that came out like... I think it was when I was getting into the hobby, right? I know who they are. Infinity Tabletop War Game Wiki. I don't know if we can find some. Yes, yes. This came out, oh, in 2005. Uh, oh, no. That's how long the publisher's been around. When did this game come out? 2013 ish maybe okay your website's dead i see okay i remember infinity i know what infinity is okay i know what this is i know what infinity is okay it's like a sci-fi like kind of like uh warhammer 40k kind of like tabletop miniature game No. But again, on BGG, like, it's not going to really pop up because it's like tabletop wargaming, right? It's not really like a board game. You know what I mean? Like a traditional board game. 2005? Has it really been out that long? I thought it was like new when I was getting into the hobby or was it like a reboot or something? I don't know. If I remember, yeah, I don't know. Oh, right here. Core book. Ah, okay, okay. Interesting. Yeah, it's like just like tabletop, you know, like, like you know, measuring and and like powers and like fighting on, you know, like with terrain and stuff, you know, like tabletop board gaming like this. I know what that is. Okay. So they, they've been around the block for a while. Okay. That makes me feel a little more confident. So they're doing a fantasy board game. Looks like you have, uh, you know, the app, you got some tiles, you got miniatures. You have a wheel. I, I don't know. Is that your like initiative wheel? First time on Kickstarter, why you should back now? Hmm. Key features, a fantasy world. In a changing world, magic has reappeared. A mysterious fog spreads through the land and echoes of Lindworm's past resonate. The future is uncertain and despite the demand of the present, decisions will need to be made. Are you willing to pay the price? I don't know. In Warcrow Adventures, actions do not have a fixed cost. Instead, you have energy cubes to spend to perform them. But wouldn't that be a cost? Allowing you to approach each turn according to the current situation. Flexibility. I like flex flexibility. Yep, an initiative tracker. I was right. This, you know, <laughs> that's kind of cool, actually. Uh, I don't know if it's too fiddly, but initiative tracker allows you to manage the order of activations of both heroes and the enemies that you will encounter on each mission. You will have to plan your actions well to take advantage during each activation. Sometimes you can even activate your characters several times before your enemies. That's what they told me about Aeon's End. Doesn't know what's happening. Um, upgrade your hero. As you complete the campaign scenarios, you'll upgrade your heroes by attaining new equipment, weaponry, and abilities. This will allow you to escape. This is all generically good stuff. And they have an app. What does it do? It'll guide you through the entire adventures campaign. So it's like replacing a big, thick storybook. I don't mind that. Narrating the events, what steps to follow, managing the AI of the enemies. Okay, now we're getting to like Descent Legends of the Dark kind of territory of app control. Not a bad thing in my mind. I like choice. I like games to be different. 
your inventory and many other amazing features. Okay, so this is like definitely on the end of like a board game that needs, like the app is a must. The app is a must and uh, it's more integrated than just being like narration or reading the story to you, whatever uh, narration or uh, sorry, choosing story options, you know. Over one, uh, 150,000 words of narrative and 10 exciting missions to explore await you in Warcrow Adventures with many hours to enjoy as you explore the mysteries of Hawthorne Point with your party of heroes. Well, I need to see a currency I know. I have Canadian dollars selected. WTF, Mang. Oh, underneath here, I see. Uh, so minimal uh, spend is 163 Canadian. Uh, it's that app upcharge, right? Software development. I have to look into this more. Oh, man. Oh, they have a demo game right here. Okay. But yeah, where's the combat? What is combat? Show me combat. Oh, you just roll dice? Just basic dice roll? Oh, man. I don't know. Guys, I don't know. I like this cube action spend thing. We have that in Oathsworn, right? You spend your little cubes, do your stamina. I like that. I like that a lot. But I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't need another one of these games right now. I have too many in the queue. I have too many fantasy... Dungeon crawly, adventure -y. I don't know. To be honest, I'm just more excited about playing hockey on in a tabletop game uh, than I am about another campaign fantasy adventure right now. I have too many to get through. I have too many that are sh in shrink. I have too many coming uh, in the mail. I have too many that I've backed already. As much as I want to support another app-driven game, uh, I'm cool with Descent. I'm cool with to see what the next Descent, Legend of the Dark Box is, whatever it's called. I'm just excited. that I'll, I'll get my fantasy app fix or with Lord of the Rings, Journeys of Middle Earth. We'll be playing that on the channel soon. My adventure app-driven fix with the Lord of the Rings IP slapped all over it. And also, like, I've been priming a lot of miniatures lately. I have a lot of miniatures to prime. I've been watching Mel work through all these games and, like, a game full of miniatures honestly hurts it at this point for me rather than helping it. I just don't need another one of these right now. So, yeah. Yeah. But it's cool. It, it looks cool. Like, I, I like the app-driven idea. But here's the thing. Here's the cool thing with the theme that I, I've learned many years ago is if this game is that great, okay, I, I'm not going to trust all this stuff, okay? I'm not clicking on any of these other videos maybe i'll click on the di designer's demo or whatever but I, I there's no one here that put their money behind the game right out of all these videos I'm, like i'm scrolling for eight years like all, all these videos here are just going to be people who've like played with a prototype or were paid to make a video playing one playthrough first look like i can't trust any of this stuff but what I can do is just wait. If they actually do deliver this game and it comes out, if you're lucky, by mid-2024, and if it's that great, just like Chronicles of Druganor, for example, you know, another dungeon crawly miniature game that looked generic AF when I saw it on, on Kickstarter. But when it released and people got a chance to play it, and I got to look more into it and see what kind of support the company was doing, then they come out with the second Kickstarter and you get another chance to get in on it with an upgrade pack, second edition, all that stuff. So to be honest, like after being burned so many times, buying games early, being an early adopter and getting like the inferior product, then have to play the waiting game to get your game fully fixed, erratas, bugs and apps fixed and ironed out. Honestly, I would rather if this game's that great, I'll hear about it again in three years from now when it comes back to Kickstarter and they have a new expansion and they're trying to raise funds, we'll see how many of these guys actually bought the game and actually play it and stream it and are hooked on it and then how many fans are still talking about it because I can pretty much put money on it that uh, no one will be talking about this game ever. Uh, it will just get forgotten. It seems too generic.
but hopefully I'm wrong. And the best part is if I'm wrong, I benefit because if it ends up being great and there's something unique here and something fun and interesting, three years from now, when I can get the second edition or four years from now, it might be a more improved, better game. And I might have room in my schedule and interest to add this to my collection to play. But again, right now, I know I've played Descent, and that is the app-driven fantasy dungeon crawler for me that we had fun playing with. They're coming out with more content for it. They're supposedly got years of it planned. And already, I get my fix from that, and I have fun with that. So I'm looking at this, and I'm good, I'm feeling like it'll be a more inferior product, and uh, maybe not as solid as that, but maybe it could be better. But the best part is I'll just wait, find out, and I'll back it later on the second Kickstarter if it even happens. Who knows? But yeah. Oh, it should. Oh, Andy, Andy's good point. Andy's saying also hopefully should go to retail. Yeah, maybe I could just buy like a base box to try it out, you know, and I don't have to pay shipping and all that stuff. And again, support my local game store. Yeah, if this shows up in retail, uh, you know, like 150 bucks maybe. But if it's the price of Descent Legends of the Dark, like a $200 retail purchase, I don't know. It doesn't have the FFG name on it. I got to be kind of like a little skeptical. But again, I'll wait to see. Uh, I just heard noise. Who's this? New subscriber. Chris, thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, John say, Rob's, if that game is awesome, it'll have a second edition. Exactly where I'm, I got to, just looking at it. It's cool, but like, I don't want to be the play tester. I don't want to be the beta tester. I don't want to have the first wave of the kickstarted kind of, you know, rushed out the door trying to meet project deadlines to answer to whiny babies who want their game now, complaining, hurry up, get me my game, get me my game. Like, and then they push out a product full of typos and erratas and, you know, balance issues, not play tested enough, poor rule books. Yeah. But it's cool. I, I, it's cool to see that there is some demand out there that some people are, some other publishers are making app-driven fantasy games. Uh, that's cool. That's cool. Man, it just keeps going, eh? All right. I give up on that. Uh, okay. What else we got? Game found. What's going on in Game Found? Anyone backing anything over here? Anyone in the chat backing anything on GameFound? What's hot other than this awesome hockey game? <laughs> a lot of junk on GameFound too. Oh, Destiny's expansion. Uh, I'm not even going to click on that because that is a retail buy for me, if anything. I will just buy that at retail. I don't care what. I don't even want to see FOMO. I don't want to see only get this if you back on GameFound. I don't want to see any of that. I'm not even going to click. I'm not, I'm not falling for it. I 100% know this will show up in retail. I don't need to pay extra for some FOMO pre-order bonuses, and I don't need to pay direct to consumer shipping. Not doing it. Sorry, Lucky Duck Games. Just bring it out to retail. It's an expansion. Get out of here. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for the super chat. Member for two months. Thank you for the support. It says, hockey for the win and pineapple on pizza heart emoji. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. So here's one. I saw this escape from New York. This is one of those, like, uh, I think it's from the 80s, right? Escape from New York. There's, like, a bunch of them, right? These are ones I never watched. And I always, I remember in, like, the mid-2000s, I was supposed to go back and watch some of these. And I didn't. And now here we are looking at a board game by Kevin Wilson. Um, and it's like a John Carpenter movie, right? Uh, yes. These are on my bucket list to go back and watch. I don't know if they've held up the test of time. But uh, one of these days, I just have to go back and watch this one, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's still good. But uh, Kurt Russell. <laughs> oh, my God. It doesn't look like it's doing too much, uh, too, too gangbusters. I don't know. This, oh, this just launched yesterday. But still. I don't know, man. But I have no nostalgic hook to this. I, 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 didn't, I didn't watch the movie. Oh my god, you get an early bird miniature. Jeremiah says, only thing I'm backing right now is Canvas finishing touches. Oh, but it was back on Kickstarter. Oh, okay, okay. 
I, I've never played Canvas, uh, Jeremiah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, Jonathan says, just got charged for Tainted Grail. Same here. Uh, so holding off uh, others for a bit. Makes sense. Chad says, Assault on Doomrock Ultimate Edition. Uh, I just want to see active right here, right? Active, not late pledge, crowdfunding, sort. I don't know. Just do that for fun. Oh, man. Escape from New York's beating my trick shot, though. Oh, man. <laughs> it's all good. I hope this doesn't get canceled, but it's already, they already printed one edition, so. I feel confident they'll make the second one because it's just it's more of the same. I don't know. I don't see that one. Salt on Doomrock is oh, is it maybe on Kickstarter. Oh, what's on Game Found? Oh, it's probably in late pledge or something, right? Yeah, it's in late pledge, that's why. That's the thing. Like they say, there's so many days left on campaigns, but like on GameFound, it's like super easy just to go late pledge. So it's like, who cares? Don't feel pressure. Just bookmark things and come back later. Okay, what is this? Welcome to the Assault Heroes. Okay, this was like a card game. Co-op solo, one of four players. I never seen this game before. Again, I I, I kind of like open crowdfunding less and less lately. And yeah. Pledge now for massive discounts. Retail availability is unlikely. Unless we get enough backers, then we'll be able to afford to add more copies of the print run, and we'll get it into retail. New to Doom Rock. Click here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, man. What's new with 4th Edition? Fourth edition? What the hell's going on here? Fourth edition of what? I've never even heard of first, second, and third edition. What is going on here? Okay, what is going on here? I mean, the game looks cool. I don't know much about it, though. Ultimate edition. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Let's just... Okay, from 2014... The first one. Salt on Doom Rock. 7.0. It's in the 2000s. Okay, sure. Uh, okay. Sorry, what the heck? All right. Um... It's a cooperative adventure game set in a humorous fantasy world. Players start the adventure by generating random heroes from two cards, combinations like Sadistic Paladin, Stinky Warrior, Frustrating Mage, or Impatient Rogue are only a few of the possibilities. A unique party of heroes will venture forth into a randomly assembled world map while gaining crazy abilities and searching for gold and ridiculous items. Heroes must face three increasingly difficult encounters. These battles play out in a grid-free, highly tactical battle system that uses character positioning, dice, and ability cards. The goal of the game is to defeat the third epic boss encounter. In order to do that, heroes must carefully exploit the map to grow as powerful as possible before they run out of time. Future highlights. Fully cooperative board game with card-driven artificial intelligence. Variable heroes and scenarios generated from over 300 cards. Grid-free. Grid highly tactical battle system with dice allocation planning phase. Fully randomized adventure on the world map with quests and events, shops, rewarding exploration, six heroes, whatever, whatever, whatever. So it's a good solo game is what I'm seeing from this. Good solo game is is what I, I'm smelling. Hmm. Scarborough saying Canvas is a great family game. Uh, as a neat combat mechanic that is somewhat location-based. That's interesting. 
Yeah, Edward says, surprised you've not heard of it. It seems right up your alley. You have never heard of this at all, ever. And that's funny. They're like, it's their fourth time since 2014. And this was on crowdfunding too. <laughs> so it's always been a crowdfunding game. Beautiful disaster games. I never heard of it, man. There's way too many games out there. Top games, Assault on Doom Rock and Crisis at Steamfall. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. Hmm. I like I really want to try it. I need to I need to see more on it though. Like I need to look into it a bit more, but where is the um Simply Doomed? What is this? Core box. I mean, that's not bad. What is the, what's the currency? What currency are we looking in? USD? Let me just uh, switch to this. Yeah, I've never heard of this. I don't know. I want to try, though. Like, I, I, I wish I knew about this. I wish this was at Gen Con or something. So I could just, like, play a demo of it. Or maybe there's, like, a demo online or something. Yeah, interesting. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Simply doomed. $103 for a little solo game. That seems pricey, no? A roguelike pledge? An expansion? A roguelike expansion? Yeah, what is the deal here? Why is this so expensive? You get the core game, a promo deck, and stretch goal. You're paying for all the stretch goal stuff. And modular expansions. 800 plus cards and sheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all paper. Okay. Okay. The miniatures, got to show off the miniatures first. It's just a marker. Okay. <laughs> so cheesy. You can glow, close your eyes, rainbow blast, cheap shot, garlic breath. Okay. Slippery escape. What is this? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. This, this screams like... Amateur, funny, passionate project. That's what I'm getting from this. Seems silly, but might be fun. Again, you've seen all I've seen. Like, I'm just looking at from a very high level. Hmm. Oh, lots of dice. I see. And those are all your markers. I get it. Silly fun in a box. Yeah. New rule book update. New rule book and update number 18. Okay. Yeah. So anyone who wants to read rules for this, go to update number 18. Get the rule book. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's the thing. Like, I, I don't know. Is Assault from Doomrock like a, uh, has it come to retail ever? Or is this the one? Oh, this is retail is unlikely. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know about that, guys. That seems a little like threatening FOMO. I, I don't know. I like them being like kind of honest a little bit. Like, you know, we probably won't go to retail. Explore the... Oh, right here. Rulebook TTS demo. Right here. Click here. It's right here. Uh, game found. What's awesome about game found is this thing on the left. Your table of contents. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I might look into it. I might. I don't know. I, I can't like I, I don't know. I think I'm I'm backed out right now. But yeah, I don't have unlimited funds, but uh yeah, that's interesting. I just like looking into some of these things, seeing what's out there. Too many games, agreed, Chad, agreed. Does BGJ say his best solo? Uh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the original game, but I'm assuming Ultimate Edition just means like, you know. Adding more stuff, but it's probably at its heart the same game it's been since 2014. Oh, Kanji, you back this Assault on Doom Rock one? There you go. You guys want, want to look into it? Kanji's got you covered. <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> I don't know. It looks funny. Yeah. 
Heroes roll and assign dice to activate abilities. Rerolls and luck mitigation are possible, but your party will need to collaborate to deal with the limits imposed on particular heroes. Yeah. I don't know. Ultra Violetta says, I've been backed out since last year. How could you not be? Yeah, there's just like too many projects, right? And it's like you only back so many. And then the problem is, as all these publishers take forever to deliver, you start getting that bad taste in your mouth. Like you put money invested in and it's just like you're not seeing returns. So then you're like, you can only put so much in and then not have anything to show for it. And then it gives you kind of like that negative. It's a kind of burnt me out and give me a negative look on crowdfunding because of that. So, and, and it's not like it's just a few bad apples. It's like become the norm is to like literally lie to your customer about your funding goal, lie to your customer about your project plans. You don't really have them nailed down uh, because you can't deliver on time. You don't, too much stuff's out of your control. So stop giving estimated dates that are like, no one ever delivers early. It's super rare. So the norm is to fake funding goal, take forever to deliver, not deliver what you promised, you know, there's always some shortcut, some delay, some update. I don't mind. It happens. You can't predict the future, but you're just dealing with a lot of amateurs. On That's the problem with crowdfunding. It's like basically anybody, I can just make up a game and a crowdfunding project and ask for your money. I maybe have, I do have project management experience and, and business analyst experience and stuff, but I don't know how to produce a board game, but there's people in that that situation that just come on here and say, look, I know how to draw on paper. Give me money. I hired an artist. I can show you board game components in a pretty picture. But I have no idea how to deal with distribution. I'm a nobody, like, you know, trying to um, negotiate uh, shipping freight, uh, negotiate prices with factories. Like, you know, sometimes it's, it's going to raise costs. And I don't know. It's hard to plan, you know. But it's like, that's what it's here for, I guess. And that's what it should be used for on the other side of the coin. So I don't know. But yeah, it's like easy to get burnt out because it's just, you feel let down over and over again. It's like, you know, that whole fool me once, whatever, you know, fool me twice, whatever, you know, shame on me, shame on you, whatever that saying is. Fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, whatever it is. Uh, I forget. I'm so tired. I need, to, <laughs> I need to end the stream soon. Um, but, um, yeah, it's just, yeah, I look at some of these and I just don't have the energy. I just don't care. I'm just like, eh, if they're good, I'll hear about them later. If they're great and I miss them, oh, well, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I, I don't have FOMO for this stuff. But yeah, that's where I'm at. I don't know. I don't know. That's where I'm at. But assault on Doomrock. I'm gonna just put that. Hold on. I uh, I need to put that in. Look into that later. Hold on. Okay. I'm putting that. Look into later. What was the other one I need to look into? No, I'm not putting that horror one. I'm not. I have to. I I got too many games. Not enough time. Like I literally could play all the games we have and that we've already kickstarted. As they arrive, I probably don't need to ever worry about anything to play on the channel ever ever like i'm good i need to continue the hunt for great games but like great games are becoming i feel like more rare and rare as we go so i don't know mhm mm yeah exactly bernardo exactly if it's that great, I'll hear about it. You guys will mention it to me. We'll see a second Kickstarter. Um, you know, it, it'll get out there. Um, yeah, I'll find out about it, I guess. If I don't, oh, well, uh, I'm not going to lose sleep. Mm. Hey, yeah, John. John says, Rob, that horror game is in the second edition. You're allowed to back it. John I I love it. Keep me straight. I like it. I like it. I preach. I gotta follow what I preach. But sometimes I have to take one for the team, though, right? I gotta I gotta back something like that Skyrim game. Nobody was like wanted to back it. Everyone was saying stay away. But I was like, you know what? I'll back it. The basic core pledge. I'll play it on the channel. We'll try it out. And if it's a stinker, we'll find out. 
and I'll take one for the team. <laughs> oh man, I hope that game's okay at least. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Either way, I didn't put too much effort into that one, so we're fine. Yeah, Mark saying, uh, asking, uh, was that Assault on Doomrock like a bigger one deck dungeon? That's the vibe I was getting, was one deck dungeon vibes. That's funny, I was thinking that. But dun one deck dungeon is very accessible, right? Very simple, clean, quick setup, quick play, quick put away, that kind of thing, right? Um, But yeah, it definitely looks like a more complex one deck dungeon. That'd be, uh, I mean, just at a high level look. I get those vibes for sure. Um, but Chad says, not like one deck dungeon. The cards aren't multi-use and not a roguelike. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I, w I went there too mentally, but I was like, I don't know. Like, hmm. Okay, Chad says, that's what happened with Explore It for me. I saw you play during the Volume 4 campaign, got Volume 2 and loved it, then late pledged for Volume 4. Yeah. So you didn't go all in back everything without ever playing anything. I respect that. I respect that, Chad. You tried something first and then went in and got later stuff once you realized you liked it. I like that. I like that. You're being smart. That's a, that sounds smart. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I don't know. I don't think I had anything else to talk about. Uh I think that was it. That's all I brought to that's all I brought to the meeting. I was whole, yeah, the 20 strong CTG game. I thought we'd be talking about that, but we didn't get to because we don't know much yet. But yeah, that's it. That's all I got. <clears throat> Anyways, thank you all for hanging out. I'm going to get out of here. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate you guys bringing up your thoughts. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so all, all I'm going to do, I'm going to debate. I'm going to discuss with Mel about the Oathsworn. Do we get the upgrade pack? I'm kind of waffling on it. I want the secret box, but do I really need another cool thing to display on a shelf? The first secret box is awesome. I'm sure the second one is. Do I need it, though? Is it worth the shipping? I don't know. Will I care when it comes out in a year or two? I don't know. But the trick shot, it seems like something new. It's something fun for me. I'll get it. I'll try it out. But supposedly there's a first edition. Supposedly you can play it online. I don't know. But yeah, um, that's where I'm at. That's like the only thing I'm interested in right now. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to probably back that one. I just don't know what to back in it. Probably pre-painted. And then an extra team is what I'm thinking. And the little referee miniature. Although it's completely useless, but it adds to the aesthetic. And I like it. So maybe do it. Um, Edward says first date only secret box. Uh, so it's first date only, I think, on the secret box if you're actually backing Old Sworn, uh, like the full game. Uh, let's see, where is it? Secret free on day one. So I think if you back one of the full pledges, like you're buying the game for the first time, you get the secret box for free, I think. I don't think you get it if you're just backing at $1 for an update pack. Because when I click the $1 before, uh, let's just say I do this. I don't know if it'll show me. Yeah, here's what happens if you click the $1. It presents the new secret box as a $15 option. So there's no day one FOMO if you already own Oathsworn. But again, it's not gameplay. It's just a... Yeah, it says with mystery contents. I maybe should have said something. I said something there maybe I shouldn't have, but um, when I was talking about putting on a shelf, but um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I don't know what the new one is though, but yeah. So the FOMO there, don't think you're getting a gameplay component. I think they're very upfront about that too. But uh, yeah, it's just like a, it was like a thank you in the first pledge. I think, I think it was just included in the first pledge, but now it's like they're using it as a FOMO bonus in the first, oh, it's gone now. 
It's gone. Yeah, because we're probably already over 24 hours. It's been out now. Yeah, when I refresh, it's gone. So forget all that. But yeah. Anyways. Yeah, you can buy it later and it only comes with core pledges. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Have Mel paint the referee like me. Okay. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> Yeah, so the secret free box on a pledge is gone. So sorry, guys. Whatever. Don't lose any sleep over that. You can always add it on. If you care. But yeah, back to what I was saying. Where's the $1 thing? Yeah, so the $1 thing. Um, You continue. And then, yeah. So there's the upgrade pack, 15 bucks. Extra standee pack. Defender sleeve, secret box, map pack, official dice tray, art book, metal coins, premium dice set, pouch pack, armory box, terrain box, all the new stuff. So for $95 US, you're supposed to get 10% discount for returning backers because they, the whole extra shipping thing. If you were back in the first Kickstarter, this is one of those companies that actually promised a discount, I think, if you paid the extra shipping because of the increased shipping costs. Um, so yeah, if you're a previous backer, so I'd actually get 10% off, but I, I don't know if that applies to like the upgrade pack. Not that that's a big discount or anything, but, um, but yeah, if you want all the new pretty goodies, uh, they're all here in, in like a $95 pack, save 10 bucks, whatever. Yeah. I know I don't care about coins and dice bag and all that. I have enough gold coins. I use ones from uh whatever I use Gloomhaven we use with ours. Um yeah, I don't need any extra fluff. I just this upgrade pack that's bugging me. It's like I want it. I just wish they could get it done and send it out as fast as possible. I know they're going to put the digital stuff online as fast as possible. But I wish they did like uh, I don't even want to print it like I just want a production quality upgrade pack as fast as possible. I want that. If it comes in like, you know, three months or something, I'd be, that's fine. But yeah, I think I'm going to end up being too far through the second or through the first edition that I won't care about these things. And it's too late. But maybe we'll look at the FAQ and see. John, I know I should take one for the team by the upgrade pack. The problem is what happens when the upgrade pack shows after we already sold the game? You know, we're done. We played all 21 scenarios. This shows up in 2024. What do I do with the upgrade pack then? That's a big waste. It's a big waste. Yeah, I don't know. Play through it a third time? No, Yogi. No, no, no. There's too many great games to be playing games more times than once. Campaign games? I'm sorry. I thought I'd replay campaign games and when I was new and young into it, but no. Part of the fun is to play through campaigns just like watching TV shows. I don't usually go back and rewatch TV shows unless they're like extra special. But there's too many new shows and things I want to experience, right? I don't know. That's just the way I look at it. That's how I relate it. I don't know. Anyways... I'm really going to get out of here now. Quit distracting me, squirrel. Quit distracting me. Come on, you guys. You made this meeting take longer than expected. What are you doing? We didn't follow. Who took action notes? Who who got the meeting minutes? <laughs> uh, but yeah. The delivery of the second printing uh, is October 2023. But of course, you have to add the extra, you know, standard three to six to 12 month delay because it's a crowdfunding project. It's just expected, like never expected to ever hit that date. It never is a thing. And even if, even if they, it is a thing that it delivers like to someone on time, it's usually like they only deliver it to like 10 people in one country started getting their project. So it's like, yeah, we're on time. Look, we started shipping to you, but in your country, it actually, you're like three months later than everyone else. You know, that's the thing. Like, October 2023 is not everybody's going to have their project. It's like, maybe we'll kind of like ship the first copy out by then. Maybe in a perfect world. But yeah. <laughs> COVID 2023. Oh no. Oh no. That would help though with the lockdowns, being able to finish some of these games, being locked in the house. 
That could be a good thing if we look at it that way. We can get back to some of those board games we backed during the first COVID lockdowns, and we can get back to them and finish them, the ones that are just arriving now. <laughs> ah, you guys. All right. I'm getting out of here. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for supporting. Thanks for the super chats today. I appreciate it. Thank you for the members. Thank you, everyone, for supporting the channel. If you'd like to click the join button down below in the video description. There are other links there if you'd like to donate, uh, help us out here. Um, cause I'm just like you, I back Kickstarters, uh, and crowdfunding games based on a budget and I don't have unlimited funds. So some of the funds coming to the channel is what I use to back certain games. Um, I'll be honest. And then some of it's used to upgrade the channel, travel to conventions. It usually goes back in the channel or just allows me to do this full time. Um, and I appreciate it. So if you'd like to donate links are in the video description, um, thanks for hanging out during the, in the cafe. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for the feedback. Thanks for the information. Thanks for the tips, everybody in the chat. I appreciate you. Thanks for uh, making this two-way street, having some fun. Um, and yeah, uh, what are we playing next? Tomorrow, we're streaming more Jurassic World. On the weekend, we're starting Sleepy Hollow, The Legends of Sleepy Hollow from Greater Than Games. We're going we're gonna to check out that game. Join us for that, getting the Halloween theme. Um, and yeah, there's other games scheduled. Again, if you're here about Old Sworn, there is more Old Sworn coming to the channel. Probably in November, I think we'll get that game back to the table. Mel's slowly working on more bosses and more characters. So we'll hopefully get to try out some new characters, try out some new scenarios and bosses soon. Um, but yeah, just stick around the channel, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.